have you back. Your, your tridents have been dis- on display on this podcast for almost 200 episodes since you were here the first time. And uh, I'm a huge fan of you and your work and your artwork. So thanks for being back. Okay. Oh, well, thank you. On the first podcast that we did, we talked a lot about like the wildlife stuff you did, the jackass, the wild boys, all that stuff. Kind of like you're like your rise to fame, so to speak, but we didn't really cover your childhood and like your early life in Cuba and your family and all that stuff. So I want to talk about that a little bit today. Well, my memory goes back to the age of four. I remember telling me, people telling me, you're four years old. Uh, As far as wildlife in Cuba, I would go in the backyard, look in a crab hole. I would put my arm in there and grab a huge land crab by the elbow and I would try to pull him out, and the crab would actually drag me. And then my dad would come find me, grab my back feet, and pull me out of out of the uh, pull me back, and we pull the crab right out of the hole. So I used to hand catch crabs at the age of four like that. So I was already getting into picking up lizards, into wildlife. I used to watch movies like Sea Hunt in Cuba when I was a kid. That stuff. I, my dad was cool. We were living in Cuba. The whole communism thing came in there. Castro took over. How long? So w- when you were a kid growing up with your parents, how long did you guys live under Batista before that whole Cuban revolution? What what year were you born? I was born in 1954. 54, okay. So the Cuban revolution came in 1959. So I was just a kid. Uh, I mean, when I was a kid, I didn't think about Batista or any of that. You know, that's just children don't think about any of that. They just life was normal for for us, you know. Uh, I noticed changes once the castle took over, like the the properties, the ranch we used to go play in, like we the National Forest, all of a sudden it became, we couldn't go there no more. The government confiscated it. And all the properties were taken and a lot of bad things were happening. I had no clue what was going on, but in the meantime, my dad joined up with the CIA to fight against Castro. And later on, he got infiltrated into Cuba. You Whoa, know, was it? How, so what was that pro, what, what happened to him when he got recruited by the CIA? Like, what was specifically going on with your dad? What was he doing? Well, it, our whole life was being uprooted. <clears throat> I mean, I was a kid, so I'm not, you know, I don't pay attention. But the adults saw that uh, we were losing our freedom in Cuba. Uh, you know, money was being confiscated, property, uh, just huge changes and very... Uh, you know, like no respect for law. He was just doing whatever they wanted to do. And, you know, a hardline communist dictatorship was taking effect. What did your parents do for work? My dad was a salesman. My mother came, he was a salesman for Bacardi. Oh, no way. Yeah. My mother came from a very wealthy family in Cuba. Their, her great-grandfather was like foreign minister, minister exterior for Cuba. He was in all these uh, minister of education. He was all those in Cuba one time or another. He's a big time politician. He owned 54,000 acres in, in Pinal del Rio. It was my favorite place when I was a little kid to go play in Cuba. They had horses there. They had mountains, forests, deer everywhere. Uh, beautiful property. He also had a beach house. He had a big house in, in Havana. So he's a very well-known politician. To this day, if you go to the, the ranch, the entrance says Hacienda Cortina. So since he was such a unknown figure in Cuba, even though the Castro regime still kept his name on the ranch. Really? And that was, so that was your grandfather? Great grandfather. My mother's grandfather. Oh, wow. So what part of Cuba were you guys living in, living in again? In Havana. You were in Havana. Okay. But the ranch was in Pinal del Rio, which is the western end of Cuba, the Oregon Mountains, the whole entire range. Mm Mm-hmm was there and to this day if tourists go to cuba that's where they go tourists go visit a place that's one of the natural wonders of cuba there's a beautiful property they got mountains and a river to go through caves they got oh. lights in there so it's it's like a spectacular place to go see so when uh, you were growing up with your dad like what kind of what kind of you were always just like roaming around looking for wildlife swimming in the ocean fishing doing that kind of stuff and cuba i went on a couple fishing trips with my dad my dad liked nature, but you know he had a family to worry about other uh, things. My dad was also an Olympic athlete. He had uh, represented Cuba in rowing. Rowing is very popular in Cuba, so his team won like a bronze medal in in London, I believe, the 1948 Olympics. Oh wow! Uh, 
they, uh, him and his brother, his uh, brother-in-law, and uh, s- several of those guys, they all came and they, and they won, you know, and they didn't win a gold medal, but they got a bronze medal. But they were like champions in Cuba, very famous. That's a cool. lot of newspaper articles about him. And so he's very much into being an athlete. He also played football for University of Anna, American football. Oh, okay. They used to play the American universities. They always got slaughtered by the American teams. That's what my mother told me. <laughs> the The Cuban team didn't stand a chance in football against like Georgia Tech and universities like that they played against. Right. They would get annihilated. Supposedly everybody would get drunk before the game mm-hmm. you, t- to take all the all the pain. Those are the stories <laughs> I heard anyways. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. So he was working for, he was a big salesman for Bacardi. So when Castro took over, what happened with Bacardi? Well, they left. They, they left Cuba completely. Yeah, they, right. they, they moved over here. They opened up uh, Bacardi Rum in Puerto Rico. Oh. That was, I think it was their base. But they had people in Miami and everything. So, But they were friends of the family. Uh, one time they sent me to a boarding school, and it was the Bacardi family that paid for it. No shit. Where for, was that at? Uh, Tampa, Tampa, Florida. It was a oh, type of school that you live in and everything. They thought it was good for me to have, mm-hmm. stay in a school like that. You know, after my mother had a real hard time because when my father was captured, uh, he was executed. Well, we're jumping. We're jumping a little far ahead. Yeah, I'm jumping know. a little ahead. So, so your your father went from working from Bac- for Bacardi. Obviously, the revolution, the Castro's rebels, like f- scoured the land in Cuba and basically took over all the businesses. Well, it, it, communism under communism, you're not allowed to own private property. You're not allowed to have wealth. You're not allowed to have money. You're not allowed to do. You know, you all have to be equally poor. That is their their method that's what uh people in this country not being educated what communism really is most of these young kids have no idea what communism is they read a few books and they think they have a an attitude that ship on the shoulder whatever it is and they think they've been taught that communism is good no communism is not good for anybody it's evil and and uh usually they'll take people who are unqualified to do a job and take the qualified one and have him do something that he's not meant to do. Hmm. They rearrange everything. And you Cubans, I mean, the people, former Cubans like you, or Cuban-born people like yourself who were part of that revolution are the people that are the most outspoken about that. They're the... Well, if you're a Cuban and you believe in communism, you know, you can stay in Cuba. Right. I mean, that's that's perfectly normal. That's what I would say. But that's an interesting thing, too. When, When Castro took over Cuba, he never mentioned communism once. No. But it was Che Guevara who was with him, who was a Marxist. Is that what it was? Yeah, Che Guevara was a Marxist, and his brother Raul was a Marxist. Castro, um, supposedly an opportunist. I mean, he's a crooked guy. Opportunist, but yeah. Opportunistic guy. And uh, so he he tied up with the Soviet Union and to mm-hmm. get protection from the United States. Right, that was much later. That came much later. So so I'm but, curious about your father, though. So like, so like in just let's say in this beginning part of the revolution, like right right after it happened in 59, what was like, your fa- you guys all stayed in Cuba, obviously. You survived I, the revolution. I was in Cuba. I had, well, we thought the revolution, I was a kid and I, all the propaganda was out there. I thought Fidel was a really cool guy. Right, people as did a lot down, of Americans. Oh yeah, no, the people going down the street, hey, Fidel's coming down from the mountains. He's great. What do you mean, who are they? And all the ladies and the, the nannies, everybody's excited about Fidel. I had no idea. I thought he was a great guy to my mother. When I kept saying, when's dad coming home? My mother turned around and told me he's not coming home. That was uh, me and my three sisters. She told us that. And she goes, Fidel is not a good guy. You know, he said he just, he killed your father. And that was like, so I went from thinking it was a good guy to all of a sudden shock. And your mom just, you asked your mom randomly one day, when's dad coming home? And she, that's how she dropped it on you? Yeah, well, time was coming by. She had to tell us sooner or later. Because mm. we have no notion of time. My mother was arrested also. She was locked up. They caught her. When they arrested my dad, they arrested her. There were several women arrested, but the Cuban government did not kill the women. And later on, I think the uh, the U.S. negotiated their, their release, kind of like with the Bay of Pigs people. Right. They did a deal like that. Mm. But the CIA guys, like my dad and the other men that were captured that day, including the head CIA guy in Cuba, Sorin Marin, they were all tried in a kangaroo court. You know, the people yeah. cracking jokes and throwing little paper balls around and laughing and everything. It's like a big party. And then they were all executed the next day. Oh, so, how, yeah. so, so your dad was recruited by CIA right after the revolution, and how was he? He was obviously recruited in Cuba. 
And what what specifically do you, do you know what he was doing for them or like was he was, infiltration team? Uh, he was uh, teams of guys that are like Felix Rodriguez. They were going to be an Escambray. Uh, Felix told me a story years later, but he went actually he went to they were training in Nicaragua at the time. That's the CIA took him to. to okay, Nicaragua. That's what I. That's I mean, of course, I'm a kid. I'm not aware of any of that. This is I found out this later on as years went by. My mother told me some more stories before she died. So your dad went with Felix to Nicaragua to train. They were down there, all the CIA guys. They were all tra- they were all part of the same team. Okay. Then later on, he meets Sorin Marin, and Sorin Marin invited him to go into Havana. And Havana was a hotbed, you know, and that's where the Castro soldiers were thick everywhere. And they were, they were uh, searching houses one after another, and somebody ran out of one house and ran into a house where they, were, where they were all hiding. And then all of a sudden they walked in, they recognized Sorin Marin, and they go, we got the big fish. And all of a sudden everybody got surrounded, the place, everybody got arrested. So uh, they caught him accidentally, but either way, I mean, it, it was a uh, hotbed. This is days before the Bay of Pigs, a couple days. Oh, really? So it's all going down at the same time. So a couple of days later, uh, after the, I believe after the Bay of Pigs invasion, they were all executed. The six guys in firing squad. The, in a a firing lot squad. of Yeah, a lot of people were killed in Cuba in the firing squad in those days. It was nonstop. Uh, years later, Castro even put his own top guys in firing squad. He executed his number one general, Ochoa. Right. He executed his two top guys, uh, the La Guardia brothers. Both of them, he, so he killed uh, Abrantes. Either they killed him or they put him in a prison where they weren't going to come out alive. You know, so he got, he cleaned house. All the people were top dogs in there. Most communist dictators do that. They killed the uh, top brass. So how old were you when you guys found out that Castro executed your father? Well, he was five years old. You were five years old. God. But after that, we were able to go to Miami. So right after that, you went to Miami? Mm-hmm. Sometime after that, my mother got released. We were able to get out because I was a military age. Military age guys were not allowed to leave. They had to join the Cuban military. Mm. So we, we got out. My mother came back t- to bury my father, and she almost never got out. She had to go to, to her grandfather's political rival, who was a communist, and ask him to help her get out. Cuba, and then he helped her get out of Cuba. So, you know, him and the grandfather went way back. You know, political rivals, but they right. knew each other. Right. They, so, still, they still went to dinners and stuff and had cocktail parties. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they were rivals, <laughs> but they had they had uh, cocktail parties together, whatever. Yeah. So when you got out, where did your sisters come with you? Come to yeah, US with all, you? Yeah, all of us came here. We were kids. My mother was like, you know, they no money or anything. They took mm. everything. So we were political refugees. And did at, your, sorry to interrupt. Um, did your dad know Rick Prado? No, because uh, Rick's, oh, Rick's, Rick's way younger. Yeah, he, I w- Rick would have been my age. Yeah, exactly. He would have been five or six exactly. years old at the time. Stupid, yeah, yeah, he knew Felix. Mm. Uh, Felix, your dad was friends with Felix because they trained in Nicaragua. Right, right. right. Felix liked my dad a lot. He came by to visit my mom sometime before oh, she died. Really? Yeah, yeah. He came by the house and all that. Did you ever talk to Felix? Yes. When did you first meet Felix? I met him a, a few times that I was at a in Miami eating a restaurant and he approached me and he goes, I'm Felix, and he introduced himself to me. And we talked. Uh, I was doing a TV show not too long ago and I ran into him on a TV show. I was talking about sharks and he was talking about Cuba and politics, you know, oh, both wow. on a topic. On a, we were on Spanish TV. We were both guests that day. And then I saw him and I go, oh, man, it's Felix. And I started talking to him. He was, he's getting older, as I could tell, you know, it's got a lot of years on him now. Did he have any cool? I mean, did, what did he did he tell you a lot of things about your father that you didn't know? Not as much to me. He said to a friend of mine that was uh, they used to go to my friend's house, and he told him that he really admired my father. That's what he told him, one of the people he admired the most. Hmm. So I mean, <clears throat> I never met anybody say anything bad about my father. You know, good or bad, I never heard anybody. Everybody, uh, he was a very likable, very hmm. popular guy. Right. Plus, I'm being an athlete, you know, famous athlete in Cuba at the time. But you, new generation doesn't know anything about that. This is all in the past. There's a new people coming up, you know. Mm. History has been erased in many cases. Uh, I got into, I was always interested in the wildlife, but once I got into Florida, the first thing they told me, there are venomous snakes in Florida, so be careful. When you're how old? 
I was six years old. Six years old. In Miami. And my friends had a ranch. And later on, when I was a young teenager, they would take me to the ranch with them. Their, their, their families are friends from families from Cuba. <clears throat> and in that ranch, I came in contact with alligators, venomous snakes, things like that. But by the time I was in high school, I was already bit by rattlesnake. I was already hand catching what? large alligators. And, and I was picking up, of course, venomous snakes left and right. I was diving, spearfishing, and all that. Did you start, when did, did you go to school when you were in Miami? I went to school in Miami elementary school. Okay. And then for high school, I went to a private school for junior high. And then in for high school, I went to Gainesville High, Gainesville, Florida. Mm. And that exposed me to a lot of the woods, a lot of venomous snakes. That's where I got bit by a venomous snake over there, and alligators. I would go after school, walk around the edge of lakes, see alligators sneak up and dive on them and hand catch them. <laughs> so I was already hand catching large alligators. I uh, was weightlifting. I uh, was their state champion weightlifter in high school. Wow. Yeah, you so, were jacked back in the day, man. Yeah. I was, were, I was, we can find some pictures of him, like old school Manny Puig photos. You were you were ripped. Walking around wearing a Speedo. Yeah, yeah. I did all that. The alligator stuff, once I learned techniques, it was more about knowing and understanding the alligator than strength. How to interact with an alligator. Right. And... A lot of the, how to hold your breath a long time, you know, mm. different techniques you pick up uh, over the years for diving, spearfishing. Mm-hmm. I spend a lot of time. Look at that one on the left, <laughs> dude. You're like you're like Zeus. How old were you there? In my forties, <sighs> right about forty four, forty five. I got um, yeah, that was probably some of my best years. Really. In my 40s, that's when I started doing more of the TV stuff. Yeah. More, I learned more about the sharks and alligators. Right. I started interacting. Uh, before that, I did a lot of, notice I got a spear gun in my hand. I did a lot of commercial spear fishing. Mm. So let's go back real quick to when you were in high school. You went to high school in Gainesville, you said? Yes. And you were just like, there was a lot of wildlife around there, a lot of woods and a lot of lakes and a lot of, obviously, the golf is there. Yes. Um, what were you doing when you were in high school? Like, you were obviously going to school, but so just you spent all your spare time just hunting and fishing and catching alligators that kind of stuff i would do things like okay i tell my friends i'm going to skip school drop me off in the woods over here and pick me up in three days and i would be out in the woods by myself you know eating whatever i caught surviving out there drinking water right out of the swamp i was doing this is 17 years old i was doing stupid stuff like that did you know you didn't know anybody else doing the same shit you were doing you just wanted to go do it by yourself i did it by myself then later on i talked to friends of mine to come out with me so I would go with some friends sometimes and do it, but that time I wasn't by myself. And we'd go out and camp out and all that. Later on, my friends bring a you know a tent, mm-hmm. sleeping bags, things I didn't bring the first time. What was it that made you want to go do that? Spend three days in the wilderness, just like hunting and catching and eating whatever you caught and being alone and I, like was there there was no fear of anything? What 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 were you like? I was attracted to that. I, look, I didn't like fast cars. I didn't like baseball. I didn't care for football. I didn't care for any of that. I care for. I wanted to live off the land. I wanted to live like Tarzan, like uh, the Native Americans. You know, off the land hunting and fishing. And I used to watch sea hunt going on the water. So I got into spearfishing a lot where I made a living spearfishing for many years. Mm-hmm. That put me in contact with sharks. And one of my first shark encounters was in the Bahamas. I had a shark bite a fin off my foot when I was uh, 18 years old before I even saw the shark. The only thing I've ever seen in my life at that time was a nurse shark. How did you get to the Bahamas when you were 18? Uh, there was this boat captain. Uh-huh. Out of Miami, he used to lobster fish in the Bahamas. Back then, it was legal, as long as you're 12 miles offshore. Uh. So my uncle said, "Hey, you want to go to the Bahamas and get your job on this boat?" And I was like, "Sure, I want to go out there." So I wanted to dive. So yeah. I'd be picking up traps all day long, but I was looking at the water. I just couldn't wait to get in there. But you know, we were working like crazy. The work was brutal. Lobster right. trapping is brutal. And these are Cuban guys. Who are like, move it. You're slow, work harder. You know, they were yelling at you all day long like that. Were you allowed to spear them or gig them? No, you were in the Bahamas. I mean, you know, uh, they used to hook them and put them in, but we weren't divers. The guys I went with were trappers. They were not divers. Okay. 
So what so I so they put crab traps down there and they, they just put uh, them lobster traps and they pull them in with a winch all day long and you stack them, clean them, and mm-hmm. bait them and put them back again. You know, I was exhausted every day. Mm-hmm. But the guy goes, "Okay, I want a grouper tonight," and they go, "Manny, go in the water and spear a grouper so we can eat it tonight." So I jumped in, shot a grouper, and a shark came from behind me and bit. Next thing you know, I thought it was one of the guys just playing a joke on me. Wait a minute, because the fin came flying right off my foot. I turned around, I saw a blur of a shark at a leaving at a million miles an hour. The fin floated. I let go of the, the grouper I just speared. Let go of that. The grouper took off the spear and all went into the bottom, went into a cave. They threw a rope over the front of the boat. One of the guys saw him hit me. So I climbed up the rope right up the highest side of the boat and got in there. And uh, they put a small boat in the water. They picked up the fin. It was a floating fin. And they could see the jacket where all the, he had missed my toes by that much. You could see the entire cut. Oh my God. Uh, well, the shark got bit on my fin. What kind of shark was it, do you know? I'm not sure to this day. I think it might have been a lemon. I can remember seeing a yellowish color. So it could have been a, a lemon shark. Mm. It was so fast. I didn't know my shark very well at that time. I didn't have a, any experience with him. Wow. And, 18 uh, years old was your first shark. And attack. then the guy, the captain asked me, can you go back and get the, the spear gun? And back then I was like, you know, I was kind of scared. And, uh, but as you know, with those guys, you can't show, you know, you gotta be mm-hmm. macho all the way. Mm-hmm. So I jumped in, went down, swam down, looking every which way, pulled a group rod, went to the surface, and he goes, can you get another one? I couldn't shoot another fish. Every time I was gonna aim at a fish, I'd look this way, look that way. I couldn't. Now, years later, little did I know, I'd be hand feeding the sharks and riding them. And right. I got bit. Gosh. Uh, that was my fin. Later on in my life, I got bit by four different types of shark. I got bit by Mako with my finger while hand feeding. I got bit by Caribbean reef shark in my leg, and I got bit by a nurse shark in this leg, and I got bit by lemon in my fingers. Right. So I, I took some shark bites. So when you're 18, you're working for the commercial fishing company, you're catching lobsters. What? How long did you work for this company, commercial fishing in the Bahamas? That was just in the summer. Just during the summers? Well, a summer month. I was out 36 days one time, and I, I went one more time out, and I was out like 20-something days, and I never went out again. Mm wasn't for you no then later on i did i got my own lobster license and i would swim under the bridges in the keys catch lobsters and go sell them i had a all you needed was a 50 dollars license i could catch as many lobster as i wanted and sell really? them but the lobsters were you know hard to get and hard to find i didn't have a boat i was swimming around with a dive flag and you know and uh, th- there was a lot of current down there so i would get a slack tide you'd make the best of it but half the time, be kicking against the current and mm-hmm. swimming down and grabbing lobsters and mm-hmm. put them in a bag. So it was brutal, brutal work. And at the end of the day, we'd just pull into the fish house. He used to pay you in cash right there. You just really put your lobsters. It was a great life. Put your lobsters on a scale, and they pay you in cash. And you were and you were how old doing this? Dad, I was in early twenties. Early twenties. By that time, doing that. And, and that's I just got, how you made all your money. Was just doing that. I did that for a while, and. Later on, I got into with some more people. You know, when I got into heavy duty into commercial spearfishing, the, I had one guy, we used to go down there, catch enough fish every day, pay, pay for a dinner, the hotel room, and go do it the next day all over again. But later on, I met some people in the Keys who were doing it more professional. Mm-hmm. We'd go out on trips, make more money, catch large amount of lobsters with boats, people knew who, where we were going and how much to be able to harvest more fish. Mm. Like, like long lines? Uh, no, no, spearfishing. Spear all fishing. spearfishing. We would do the Goliath, like, I remember one trip we came back, uh, I think we made like $1,400 worth of Goliath grouper each. You know, after we paid for the gas, we paid for the food, paid for everything, and a third part for the boat, we divided mm. up. You know, that's a good paycheck. Other days I make $400, $500. This is a long time ago, though. So it was more money back then. Mm-hmm. We would spear grouper, uh, snapper, hogfish. Also did tropicals for a while. And in lobster season, I would do lobsters. But whatever we found that had, it was worth money, we'd shoot, including the sharks. Really? I used to shoot the sharks before I started the, making the movies. Once I- What kind of sharks did you shoot most, the most? What we shot down there was uh, lemon, bull, and great hammerhead. God. Occasionally, we would shoot a you know, Caribbean reef shark and black tip. And were you, were you, you weren't hunting the sharks. They would just show up looking for I, your fish, and then you would just- they were, they were, but we would all, they got it from me. First thing we do, we shoot a barracuda and tie it to a stringer. Like our guy would drop you off in the middle of the ocean and pick you up later, or you'd have to swim a couple miles to where the boat was anchored. 
and work your way that way. So we'd be dragging fish with us, and when a shark would show up, we'd pop it, and we'd sell the shark. We used to sell the fins, mm. sell the meat, cut the jaws out, take pictures of the shark, hang up the jaws on, on the wall. We did all that. Mm. Then later on, um, when we wanted to start making money from like being in the water, interacting with sharks, that was more, there's more profit in that than killing the shark. Mm. So the shark was more valuable to us alive. So at that time, I was like, hey, you know, they're killing too many sharks <laughs> at that time. We would have a hard time finding them, you know, so it wasn't, you could spearfish all day long without ever seeing a shark. Mm -hmm. uh, sharks were being, then everybody got into commercial log lining for sharks mm -hmm. and they got depleted. It was really hard to find sharks. What they year, were getting wiped out. What year roughly did uh, commercial long lining for sharks start to kick up? I would be probably 30, some, 30 years ago, I would think. I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep, okay, I was in. It's like the ni early 90s? My, my 40s. I would be in my 40s. Yeah, I would say early 90s and all that. It started picking up. Mm -hmm. Once they they started protecting certain types of shark, like uh, they put a ban on catching sandbar shark. Once a sandbar shark was protected, the commercial guys, there was no reason for to go long lining for shark anymore. You couldn't make any money. What is that shark? What kind of oh, shark? That, is that a, is that that, a mako? That's a mako. That's, oh, okay. Yeah, that's not my shark. That's Mark, Mark the Shark's uh, uh, mako. Okay. Uh, he just, I came over with a, with a scientist, Dr. Castro, to, to look at the, uh, the shark. And uh, so he got a picture with me. You know, he shows Where'd you guys, where did he catch that? Miami. Oh, Miami. Okay. The, you're, not allowed, you're not allowed to get him anymore, but he's got permits. He's still out there catching sharks. He's, Is he really? Oh, yeah, yeah. He's. You should bring him on the show if you want. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's bombastic and he'll talk about. Oh, is he? <laughs> That's a big ass Mako. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I think it was 10 feet. I remember. Mm. I've I've encountered makos that big in Louisiana. As a matter of fact, for Shark Week, I was riding a big mako, if anything bigger than that one. Yeah. Riding it? Yeah. Well, hand feeding it, riding it, everything. I did a, um, a lot of stuff with makos. I really yeah. liked, I liked the makos a good shark to work with, very dangerous, but the open ocean sharks will come at you quicker because there's less food out there. Right, it's like a desert. So, yeah, so it's more, they're more aggressive. Yeah. Which is, it's perfect. That's a mako shark. I a carved. little baby mako. I, that was a that was no. That's a mako. I carved out of bronze. Oh, you carved it? Yeah, that's yeah. It's bronze. Whoa! You can't click on it. That's okay. Look at that, Manny. That's a bronze. I'm a I'm an artist, so I sculpted that. That's that's, that's all bronze incredible. right there. Incredible. That weighs about eighty five pounds. It's hollow, but it's still eighty five pounds. But it looks like a real mako. Yeah, it looks from. exactly like a, a real mako. It looks like it looks like I, one of those taxidermy ones. Yeah, yeah. No, but I did it by hand. I did a hammerhead, and I did alligator, and I did a goliath grouper. Uh, so, runs. so when you started doing this commercial spearfishing in like your early twenties, what, what was it that made you? Did you just like have this inner sort of desire to? push the limits farther than anybody else like did you feel like that was kind of what you were destined to do like you wanted to kind of outdo everybody else dive deeper than everybody else find like catch these fish like more primitively than anybody else was like what was it in you that made you at at first i wanted to make a living instead of jobs that i didn't like i wanted to spearfish for a living is i don't want to have a, a job I like the idea of going out there to challenge of catching fish. Then later on, I was always attracted to catching fish instead of with a spear with my hands. And I had fantasies of catching sharks with my hands. So later on, that all happened, just like catching alligators by hand. In high school, I was catching alligators by but hand. But I'm saying, like, what was it? What was it in you that made you have this this desire to do this? Like, what made you want to push all these limits and do all these things that nobody else has ever done? I wanted to do what my fantasies were when I was a child. I want to do what Tarzan did in movies. It wasn't real. I want to do it for real. Mm. And and I said, I may not be the deepest diver in the world or the best spearfisher in the world, but when it came to hand fishing and all the stuff, yeah, I, I took I took off with that. Mm. Most you, people wouldn't think of that. They wouldn't. It didn't cross their mind to try to do right. to catch a giant Goliath or 
to catch a shark with their hands and things like that, that, that all started kicking to me. I, as the more I learned, I started studying them and looking at them and I would pick up. I can get close to them. I can do this. I start seeing ideas like that, like catching a barracuda with a knife. I saw how close the barracudas came to me and the son told me, pull out your knife and get one. And I did. But I literally hit them with my hands first. So I said, if I can touch them, as they were attacking the fish I had in my hand, uh, if I can touch them, I can get one with a knife. And I stuck and I grabbed them by the neck real quick. That's the only cuda ever caught with a knife. If I would have slipped, that cuda would probably bit me right here. So I had them right here like this. Yeah, barracudas are terrifying fish. Even when like I'm diving and spearfishing, I'm almost more afraid of barracudas than I am of seeing a shark. Do you feel the same way? No, I'm not. I mean, you're not, not afraid of any of them. I'm not like, afraid, of, afraid of, I shot a lot of barracudas to feed the sharks and for me to eat. But I've shot so many cudas I could never count them. <laughs> Big ones, small ones. And uh, Type in Manny Puig after barracuda and see find some of the photos. But, but like- I'm, I know a lot of people have been hurt by barracudas real bad. Yeah, they're, they're and they get humongous. They get they, bigger than some sharks too. No, they, the they biggest cuda I've ever read about was long six feet, nine inches. And- so walk me through how you caught that barracuda. Like what was going on? Well, and there was a spearfishing competition on uh, Omer. They, yeah. they were holding it. They invited me there. I was, they used to sponsor me. So I went up mm -hmm. there and it was in North Carolina. They were in the Outer Banks. So the bunch of groups were there. So I wasn't, I wasn't participating. I was just hanging out so I could go with any crew I wanted that day. And I went with uh, Eric Salado and Luis Pereira. These are... Uh, a doctor and an engineer. Both of them are fanatical spear fishermen from Cuba. And they're very classy guys, but, but you look at them, you couldn't believe how good these guys can dive. But they go to all these competitions. So those guys were in the water diving. They're, you know, they're getting the fish they need for the competition. Free diving or scuba diving? Free diving. It's all free diving. So it's in deep water. They're going probably halfway down, whatever. It's 150 to the bottom. And the guy in the boat says, Manny, can you get me a spade fish or a sheep pit? Is that, you know, I want to take it home to eat. The the mate in the boat asked me, I said, no problem. So I took the pole spear. She, the spade fish swim like mid-water. So I went down and shot a spade fish. In no time, there were like 20 barracudas on top attacking me. And they were biting at the at the spade fish. They were really ready to bite my hands. And I was literally pushing them away. I couldn't keep them off of me. So it occurred to me to pull the knife out, stick it. So I stuck with the knife and grabbed it by the gills immediately. When I stabbed him, he bit harder on the piece of fish. And that gave me the break to grab him real quick. If not, he got to turn on me. Then I brought him back. A bull shark came up. He wanted to eat it, but I wanted a picture with that cuda. I never caught one with a knife. I'm not going to catch another one. So I wanted to boat it and get a picture with it. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't let the bull shark have it. Oh, so what did you do to get the bull shark to, not to eat it? I pulled, away, pulled it away from him, charged him. I got aggressive with him. Charged the bull shark? When you're being attacked by a shark, if you show aggression, that's usually a good way to save you most of the time. Not always... It'll work. Uh, you want to stay safe from sharks? There's nothing better than trusting the, the Lord thy God because they're his creatures. Uh, he saved me from them many times. Let's put it this way. How did you know that? How did you know to charge him? You had, had you been in that situation before? This episode of the podcast is brought to you by ExpressVPN. When you use the bathroom, you always close the door behind you, right? You don't want some random passerby looking in at you. So why would you let people look in on you when you go online? Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like using the bathroom and not shutting the door. Did you know that internet service providers like AT&T and Verizon know every single website you visit? And what's worse is they sell this information to ad companies and tech giants who will use that data to target you. ExpressVPN puts a stop to all of this. It creates a secure encrypted tunnel between you and your device and the internet so that your online activity can't be seen by anyone. I personally love using ExpressVPN because Netflix only gives you a small fraction of their entire content library depending on where you're located. But with ExpressVPN, you can access 100% of their content library, giving you access to thousands of more shows. And the best part is using ExpressVPN is as easy as closing the bathroom door. 
All you got to do is fire up the app, press one button, and you're protected. ExpressVPN is the world's number one rated VPN by TechRadar, The Verge, and countless others. So if you're like me and you think your online activity is your business, secure yourself by visiting expressvpn.com forward slash Danny today. Use my link and get an extra three months for free. It's expressvpn.com forward slash Danny. It's linked below. Now back to the show. Yeah, you got to fight back or else uh, if you run from them, I did that experiment. I saw a shark. Okay, I'm going to swim as fast as I can to the boat to get away, right? Uh-huh. I turned around. The shark was, was on me immediately. I did it again. He attacked me again. So I figured out, okay, if I go after him, he runs the other way. But if you start panicking, trying to get away, he attacks if he's hungry. Mm. Like when you're free diving, you'll go down. And as you're coming up for air, sometimes you look down and you see a shark following you because he thinks you're running away from him. And you really you need to get up for air. But it right. looks like you're on the run. So you're acting like prey. Right. He is a predator. Predator attacks prey. If you act like a predator, you scare him away because he thinks you're going to, sharks attack each other. He thinks you're going to take a chunk out of him. Mm. Like a bull shark will get attacked by a large great hammerhead, for example. Right. So he's going to, uh, if you show aggression, his natural instinct is to run from you. So you can bluff him. Wow. Doesn't so always work. Y- you were able to scare the bull shark away and you got that barracuda in the boat. I've had to fight off bull sharks a million times in my life as a spear fisherman. And also, I used to create shark feeding frenzies for, you know, to interact for, for the shows and stuff. So you can probably, there's videos on YouTube of spear fishermen literally chumming up bull sharks and then chasing the bull sharks to shoot cobia off of their backs. And it is like a, I think that's a thing people do still on the East Coast where, because these giant bull sharks, these like 12, 15 foot long bull sharks will just be cruising and there'll be these huge cobia that just swim like alongside them. They attract the shark by pulling the rubber bands on their spear gun and popping them. Then the bull shark thinks you're shooting fish, he, he runs up or they take a plastic bottle and make a sound with it, a crackling sound. So when he comes up, the guys will go. That one on the very right, top right, yeah. Yeah, when, yeah, they, uh, that, those are following a tiger. See, they also follow the rays, see? But what happens is, every once in a while, the shark is actually very hungry. And, and, that, 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 so there's videos that, of those cobia actually swimming on top of the bull sharks, and they shoot well, they, the cobia. They, swim, they follow them from behind. When they shoot them, sometimes the shark will turn around and attack. I know divers have been de- demolished by doing that by a bull shark. After they shoot the cobia, the shark turns around instead of going after Kobe, it goes after the diver mm. and tears them apart. That seems like a bad idea. It, it's a great, these guys are gutsy. It's a great adventure. It's an awesome way to catch a fish, but it's a bad idea because you're going to get killed sooner or later. Right. So have you ever done this? Uh, no, but I've done other things. I've yeah, shot, well, I've shot, yeah, yeah. I've shot fish when I'm running out of bait. I'll shoot fish right there to attract the sharks and everything. I, I've done everything you can imagine, you know, mm. to, to attract the, Look at this. Look at yeah, this. Yeah, there you go. See? Yeah, full screen this if you can, see, Steven. Yeah, there's bull sharks you see everywhere there. So and look, they're got, surrounded by bull sharks. Yeah. Well, a lot of guys get hurt doing that. You may get away with one Whoa. day. Whoa. Not another day. There's like a hundred bull sharks all around them. Uh, yeah, they're looking for a cobia following one of them. There's your cobia. So there's right cobias there. there's right, there. Cobia yep. right there. Yep. See? Shoots the cobia. No sharks are chasing him. Well, sometimes the shark is not hungry. He's He's got to be hungry for, for that to happen. If that shark wanted to, couldn't he just turn around and eat that cobia? He, they do sometimes. Sometimes they'll eat the cobia. Other times they'll eat the... I'm saying like before the they shoot it. Before like, even if the... No. Look, look, see, there's a bull shark on the attack right there. See how the guy fended him off? No, no. Rewind that by like 30 seconds. He, yeah, yeah. He, he knew what he was doing. Okay. All right, let's see what's going on. He shot the cobia. He's swimming back to the surface. Here comes a bull shark. Bull shark attack. Okay, see. Oh, uh, he just pointed the thing at him. If he if he turned around and tried to get the boat, that bull shark would have killed him. They're getting fired up now. Oh God! See, yeah, look at that. See how they they're under attack. And there's blood everywhere and everything. Okay, get out of the water. Get out. Now, wh- where does like a bull shark rank on like, as uh, far as like dangerous sharks? Probably the world's most dangerous shark. Why is that? Okay, this see how clear that water is. Imagine yeah. being attacked like that. 
and you're in the intercoastal with zero visibility. You won't see them coming. Right. They go up river, they go in the beaches, and they attack people. He's a coastal shark, and he's got a hellacious temper. On top of that, he is a man killer, a man eater, and he's got a hellacious temper. And uh, his bite is lethal. His teeth are razor sharp. You can shave your arms with them. And they can they can bite three times harder than a great white shark. Three times harder. Yeah. They're smaller, but they're deadlier. So so how would you compare it? How is that they're... Their bite is harder than a great white, but why isn't a great white? So if you were, if you were hypothetically, we put you in a, a swimming pool with a great white and a bull shark, how would the great white be, or how would the bull shark be deadlier? Cause it would just be more aggressive to eat you. There's more of them in the water. They're, they're very shy, but they're very explosive in their attacks. And, uh, great whites are picky eaters. Mm. The bull is not as picky. Oh, Okay. Like a tiger usually eats a person because he's not his picky eater. He's a diet is very varied. But a tiger shark doesn't have a bad temper. Neither does a great white like a bull shark does. Okay. Bull shark and lemons have bad tempers. They have high t- levels of testosterone. Mm. If, if you spear him and he's on the end of the line, he'll come after you. If you catch him rod and reel, you get in the water with him, usually he'll come after you. Yeah, these guys are still shooting these cobia, surrounded by these bull sharks. There might be different days put together, but right. yeah, a lot of guys have been bit doing that. So, so this is just normal for when you were spearfishing, doing these competitions. It was just normal to see these bull sharks. You just kind of be got to no, be cognizant there, of them. For a while, there's a lot of bull shark out there right now. For many years, there was no sharks. The the commercial long lining have decimated them, and there was hardly any sharks around. So, you know, so they passed all the conservation laws. Now they're back. What year did they pass those converse, conservation laws? I'm not sure. They came little by little. You know, understand I was out of commercial spearfishing for quite a while. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they, they the started, a, no, they, they, one species after another started being stopped. You know, you weren't allowed to kill the, the dusky. The uh, okay. Longfin mako, a goyle shark. Mm-hmm. Great white shark is protected. That's why there's more and more of them now right now. So, of course, when you protect something, they come back. The Goliath grouper was hunted to oblivion. Now it's coming back. You start mm. seeing more and more. The sharks are they're everywhere. There's a disbalance out there. You know, uh, every once in a while, a good shark tournament to balance things out might mm. be a good idea. Yeah. I like the spearing because you could target the type of shark they need to be targeted. Yeah. Instead of there was a real rare species. Bycatch. You, you don't want to catch it on bycatch. So uh, my idea was, uh, you know, spearing tournament. That's my idea. Nobody, nobody's ever going to agree with me, but. Right. To go out and uh, and have a tournament, let the guys shoot several sharks every so often to kind of like mm. level out the fish and shark population to a balance. Because it's it's if you talk to divers and fishermen, they can't get a fish in the boat half of the time. So is it a? Pro- do you think there's a problem with there being? You said there's way too many sharks out there right now, and then people see them everywhere. Do you think there's a problem with there being too many sharks? If you're like a biologist, he says, "Well, it's a healthy ocean. It's full of dangerous sharks." But if you're just a human being, what's going to water? It's a bad idea. You know, it's it's a balance because it depends how you look at it. Yeah, the healthy ocean is a dangerous ocean, but uh, I believe that you know God gave us a right to fish, hunt, and you know, grow crops, harvest food, harvest lumber, whatever we need from the earth. The earth provides. Mm-hmm. But so we're not we don't worship the sharks. The shark, you know, they're in the ocean, but we're caretakers. But it ain't like oh, it belongs to them. They're the gods of the sea. No, they're not. There's, the, there's a god that made them, <laughs> but they're not the gods of the sea. Manny Puig's the god of the sea. <laughs> no, no, no. no. I'm, uh, if there's I'm any a, human that's closest to Poseidon, it's you. No, no, no. I, I, no, no. Keep it humble. I'm, uh, I believe in Jesus Christ. He's my Lord and Savior, and I keep it at, I keep it at that. That's his creation. That's his ocean. Mm-hmm. So his creation has been my adventure. He kept me alive because he can let those animals tear you apart. To keep me humble, every once in a while you get things like this. Oh yeah, show, show, hold it up on this side. Manny's got the the perma shocker. <laughs> this is a, 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 a rattlesnake bite. That's the second rattlesnake bite I got. I got bit in high school on this thumb. I came out okay from that one. This is a yeah. Western Diamond back in Texas, and that was a, a bad bite. Yeah, we're gonna. I want to get to that. I, I want to stay on the sharks for a little bit though. We, I definitely and I got bit that. by sharks. I got bit by an alligator in the back. Came out good from that one. Yeah. I came out good from everything except maybe this one. I got gored by a boar in this farm too. 
you there's more and more stories popping up every day about people being attacked by sharks. It seems like it's I don't know like it's hard to under, to really know if it's just the media blowing shit out of proportion or if this stuff happens all the time. They just it, don't always report. It's on increasing. It. It's increasing because there's more sharks out there and there's more people in the water. So when you put a lot of people and a lot of sharks in the water, mm -hmm. you're going to get more incidents. Wildlife is making a comeback around the world in many places, and there is a lot of wildlife attacking people as far as bears, tigers, lions, things like that. Do you know any like the numbers as far as like shark populations now compared to like 30 years ago? A whole lot more. A whole lot more. A worldwide. Whole, I mean, not worldwide. U.S. waters. U.S. waters. Now, worldwide, yeah, we talk about tiger population is growing in India, for example. Uh, leopards in Africa, yeah, it's it's growing tremendously. Uh, mountain lions in North America, yeah, including Florida, yeah, they're increasing. Bears are increasing. Uh, a few places, wildlife, certain wildlife is very endangered. You know, uh, Sumatran tiger, he's in trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, a few species like that. Uh, Gorillas are thriving, lowland gorilla. Mountain gorilla, maybe not so. Mm. But the lowland, there's parts in the Congo where there's hundreds, a couple hundred thousand of them. And why are these animals, in, like, why is their population growing so fast? Uh, protection loss. And I also believe as end time, God might be multiplying the animals for the end time. Because they're going to attack people. Can you explain your belief in that? Uh the pale, the pale rider in the Bible mm -hmm. kills one-fourth of the world's population through war, hunger, disease, pestilence, and by the beasts of the earth, wild animals. The pale rider. It's a symbol of okay. death, symbol destruction. Of death. That's a biblical thing. So apart from all I know about wildlife, I believe the Bible word for word. And so it's fitting in the pattern. You got more wildlife, more attacks. The wolf populations are growing around the world. And there's more. Now, do I like wildlife? Yeah, I'm a fanatic about all. Oh, I'm fascinated with bears, sharks, alligators, uh, all kinds of fish, all kinds of wildlife. But I'm a fanatic of all that. But I'm aware that, that these attacks have been increasing more and more. Like the snakes kill 100,000, 100,000 people a year. Mm -hmm. Venomous snakes. They used to kill a lot less than that. It's just... It's growing. How many people do sharks kill a year? Do you know? Not as many as like maybe, maybe find that. crocodiles and all that. They don't really know. Oh, look at this. Great white shark population is booming, researchers say. Uh, uh, what a, this is posted l literally last month. Okay. The result, of, a little bit. the result of that is it's real simple. You can't kill seals, which is what they eat, and you can't kill them. So we've made this world, this design. Scroll up. It's a sh right, great down. white shark haven. Right there. A summer begin, the, as summer begins uh, and people spend more time in the ocean, researchers are on the verge of learning more about the mysterious apex predator that, swim, that swims beneath the surface. On the research ship the Atlantic in the Atlantic Ocean, 12 miles off the coast of North Carolina, a group of scientists has been studying and tracking great white sharks. We're seeing um, an ocean that's teeming with life like we have, haven't seen since the 40s or 50s. Chris Fisher, founder of the research organization, Osearch told CBS News. Osearch has been studying and tagging great whites for the last decade. In that time, Fisher has observed an increase in the number of white sharks. Um, da -ba 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 -ba. Okay. Wow. So, you believe me now? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. I never doubted you. <laughs> okay. When I was uh, doing my spearfishing, I never once encountered a tiger shark on the Atlantic. Not one time. Now, the guys see them all the time. They, were, they have been wiped out. There were no tiger sharks left. In the 50s, there were. But after that, gone. Right. Now, when I found my first tigers, we were 100 miles in the Gulf of Mexico with a 500-pound sacuda ripping them apart. Hour after hour after hour, we had a couple hundred sharks around us before the tigers finally showed up. Those were my first tigers. Wow. And I was hands-on right away. How are you chumming them up? With what? Barracuda. Barracuda. We went out there. We speared cuda after cuda after cuda after cuda. Every coup that you spirit potentially can bite you. But that was like normal every day. Especially filming the sharks, you got to feed them or they're not coming. So, you know, you don't buy bait. They like fresh. So to get fresh food, you got to get it right there. We have spirit barracudas to mm -hmm. feed them. Uh, when I went to Hawaii, they brought me fresh skipjack tuna. And that's what I fed the tigers over there. 
So you were saying a minute ago, we kind of got off track, but you were saying that the sound of popping the bands on a spear gun attracts the sharks now. Because is sharks- that, how, how recent is that? It, sharks are very smart. They learn. Yeah. They, they uh, certain places where they know when the fish are pulling up with the boat and they drop anchor and he's going to start fishing, they pull up because they know he's going to catch fish and going to steal them. Sharks are not stupid. They're smart. Mm -hmm. Alligators are not stupid. They're smart. Right. You know, but Florida, we have alligator attacks and shark attacks. So like they're, I know in U.S. waters are big because they're protected. Now, if you go to maybe South China Sea, they might be getting exterminated over there. Right. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Like uh, China's just about wiped out the Chinese tiger. Really? Yeah, they have Manchurian tiger, which is borders Russia, because that's really a Russian, uh, Russian protected. There, there have been two, 10, 12 foot tiger sharks that have been caught right off the beach right here in the last week. Yeah, uh, twenty years ago, you wouldn't. Hear, that was unheard of. Right. The tigers are back. Have you? You let's pull up that video um, of that guy in Egypt who got eaten by the tiger shark. Now I told you this on the phone. I was like freaked out when I saw this because I have never. I already pulled a tab, a tab up for you. I have never heard, other than like open ocean shipwrecks with like you know way out in the middle of the ocean where like the oceanic white tips will devour and eat the people because there's nothing else to eat. It's like a desert out there. But I've never heard of a story of somebody near the beach getting fully devoured by a shark. Like I've heard. Like obviously well, you hear the bites. Well, it, there was a girl killed in shallow water in the Bahamas in front of her parents by three tiger sharks ate her in front of her family recently. There's no video of it, but they killed her. The parents saw it. Three of them. Three tiger sharks ganged up on the daughter on uh, Hog Island, uh, right there where the hogs go swimming. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In the shallow water, she was in there swimming. What? And they got her there. There's a lot of, there's a tiger beach in the Bahamas. There's a lot of tigers there. And they, you know, when these things are hungry, they're not docile. They can pick up speed, and they're devastating predators. Do you think there's a... Let's watch this. Uh, yeah, full screen that video. And the Red Sea. The, the Red Sea yeah. has... Um, when you're off the shore, just a little distance, it drops to incredible depth. Oh, really? So you could be on the beach, and you could see an oceanic white tip. Because uh -huh. you swim 100 feet from shore in some places, and it drops thousands of feet. So you have these ocean sharks that come in here. There were three attacks in the Red Sea not too long ago mm -hmm. by mako shark and oceanic white tip. The mako, they caught him later on with human remains in his belly. Mm. And because you go off, there were divers, you go off the, off the reef, you know, 100 feet or so, and you're ready in the middle of the ocean. Because right. it's, so the pelagic sharks can visit you right there. But the Red Sea has tigers, makos, and oceanic white tips. Yeah, and I think this was like the third tiger shark fatality in like the last two years off of this same beach in uh egypt yeah it's uh so what Red is sea. going on it's not full screening what the frick Try there you go there it goes right there not full screening that's okay it doesn't matter because we're not going to see it anyways so what is the shark doing to him right there Remove, cutting him to pieces. They recovered he's his body the next day. He's screaming. He's oh screaming for help. It, probably, it might have bit a leg off already. Oh my god! This is horrible. There he goes. Oh my god! Look at him. Understand that. Uh, oh my god! He's attacking like he's a turtle. A, a he's barely moving. Okay, a tiger shark's oh teeth. Oh my god! What is this? Look. Oh my god! Okay, you can pause it. A tiger shark's teeth look like this. They aim this way. And then they also aim the other way. So what it does is designed for cutting turtle shells in half. So he saws back and forth. They can slide through bones and everything like this. That's what a teeth saw is. Not just like a giant saw. One after another goes like this. So he does this, and then he'll they'll either keep sawing until they cut uh, a piece of turtle shell. They eat the sea turtles. So it's a tiger shark is is designed. And it's a devastating predator. <sighs> Yeah, and I guess this was a uh, this was actually a pregnant. From what I read, this was a pregnant female that was like roaming around. They had footage of the shark actually on Twitter swimming like around the docks very slowly, and they saw it like up to an hour before this happened. Looking for food. Sometimes uh, you know they don't find fish. 
to lead to person. So what do you do? What what would you do in this situation? Well, if you were this kid out there, uh, don't go into water if it's clear water, which it is out there. Don't yeah. go into water without a mask, snorkel, and fins, and bring a shark billy with you to push a shark off to mm -hmm. discourage his attack. Mm -hmm. You know, make him go somewhere else, fight him, something to fight him with. But if you don't have any of that, like if you're just swimming with no got no fins, don't, no no mask, don't do it. But I'm saying if you already are, what do you, what the hell do you do? Nothing. Like you can't do anything about it. That guy, no, he's a sitting duck. He can't do anything about it. That's in, you know, pray. Pray to the God that he changes, sends a shark, so a miracle. Only a miracle can save him at that time. What about like, if hypothetically you're, you're in that situation, do you try to charge it? Do you try to swim towards it? What do you try to do? Well, Grab its gills? If he's in shallow water and you can run up to it and see him, you can kick him when he comes near you or something like that. The water's like this deep. Mm -hmm. But if you're over your head and everything, you, 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 he comes from below. You don't know where he's coming from. You, you don't have a mask on. You have no idea. You, you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're sitting in the blind. You're sitting duck. You're totally helpless. But a, a skilled diver like those guys are hunting the, the cobias mm -hmm. or myself, whatever, you can right. fight them off. I've had to fight off sharks many, many times on the attacks. I mean, super intense attacks. If you're on the beach watching this, what would I was you do? Very, I was too comfortable out there doing this kind of right. stuff. Way, way, way too comfortable. All my life, it was like a second nature to me. To be in the middle of a shark feeding frenzy, it's like being in, in a party. It was just, I enjoyed every minute of it. But that's, that's, part of, used to that's part of it too, though, because you're so calm. The sharks don't sense any sort of fear. Well, they, if you get excited, sometimes they back away. It can affect them in different ways. But the whole idea was for me to get the sharks fired up so they would come in aggressively to get footage. If they're off in a distance, you're not getting anything. Mm. So you want the sharks on you. Now, what that does, it puts everybody who's ever working with you in severe danger. Right, and people people start to get scared too. And well, start to get tense up. if you have people with you, they're not scared. They'll be right there with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are people that are that are that are like that kind of stuff, and they'll stay right there. Not everybody will, is willing to do that, but I give people a false sense of security when I was. Yeah, Steve was talking about that. Yeah, Steve was saying whenever they were in the water with you, he like wasn't as scared because you were there. He felt protected. He, yeah, he, he, he would he wouldn't pay attention. Be like, I, it's always, okay. I call it a, it's a false sense of security, but it works. You get that, you know you. you He'll, he's he's more comfortable there. Mm -hmm. I put him in bad stuff on a surfboard with a bunch of sharks uh, biting fish around a surfboard. Didn't you tell me that he want him or Chris Pontius they wanted to be trolled through Boca Grande in a tarpon suit? They we they told they did all, I'm trying to remember everything they did. They come up with a bunch yeah. of ideas that I didn't do all of the ideas they had. Right. I noticed one thing we did troll Chris through a pack of uh, killer whales in Alaska which is probably the worst thing ever. Because everybody thinks killer whales are just, no, no, killer whales are dangerous. <laughs> They're dangerous. The thing about, I can bluff a shark. I can defend myself. You believe most of those guys can, but killer whales are after you. Then you're not going to be able to do anything. I've never heard of a killer whale attacking a human being. Have you? Well, and... And SeaWorld, one killed three people. Right, yeah. That one murdered three people because of what they fucking did to it. They well, put it in prison. But what about if, if a killer whale in the ocean decides it doesn't like you or it feels like... He doesn't have any laws. He doesn't have a rule book. Okay, I'm not supposed to bother people. Where does that... Mm -hmm. He can just, like any animal... Listen, a horse can come up and kick you and bite you. Right. Okay, a dog will bite you sometimes. Sometimes they won't. Killer whales they have different personalities. Don't they Different like gang up techniques. on great whites? They kill great whites. They know how, they're smart. They know how to kill everything out there. Just you know, like if I'm gonna catch a fish, strategically you figure it out how to do it. They strategically figure out, okay, that whale's bigger than than us. Well, we're gonna gang up on it. We're gonna attack it this way. They figure out how to to do their their hunt mm. and how to get it. Yeah. So. When you were, oh yeah, and they beach themselves too. They literally freaking swim up on the beach and eat shit, eat f seals and stuff. Look at that. God. Yeah. Those the, things are crazy. The wild world is a dangerous place. You swam with orcas, right? Yeah, in Alaska. Walk me through that day and what you were doing and what made you decide to jump off the boat well, with a bunch of orcas. We're making a show. We need action. I had uh, the, we're doing uh, wild boys. And we went out whale watching. So I put on my suit. Uh, they go, okay, there's a pot of killer whales coming this way. And I told the captain, okay, they're heading that way. Take your boat, pull up in front, drop me off 
in their path. So so they'll intercept me. And that's how we did that. And they came real close to me. The water's very dirty, so I could only see them when they were very, very close to me. What visibility was like, what, four or five feet? I I don't think I could see you. Wow. That's how dirty it was. God. But I could see their fins and all that coming up, and then finally uh, two of them approached me where I could see their the black and white on them real close up to me like that. They they stared at me up close, investigating me. But all I got to do is just bite you. That's it. And they They're done. They just grab on you and just drag you yeah, down. Yeah, but when your adrenaline's running or doing a show, it's like the pressure is on. Let's make make things happen. You know, you want to do the best of what you're, Were you're, you... You want your job to be the best. What, what was going through your head when those orcas were swimming right towards you? Were you scared? Were you comfortable? What were, were you just full I, of adrenaline? I wasn't. I was full of adrenaline. But I shouldn't be comfortable. I shouldn't. I shouldn't do that again. But at that time, the water was very dirty. People done it, did it later on in clear water, but I did mm. it in dirty water. And some people think everything, nothing is fine. You feel like for a while, okay, we're okay, we're fine. They didn't hurt anybody. We're mm-hmm. fine. Keep going. Okay, we got what we want. Let's just get out of here. It's right. enough is enough. Oh, what is? Oh, is that an orca attacking a human at Sea World? Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, that's brutal, man. <laughs> See, everything's okay one minute. Then You don't know what a killer whale's thinking sometimes. It's no. an intelligent animal. Every animal, every alligator, when we, we haven't talked much about alligators. I spend many years among the alligators. Daytime, nighttime, diving with them at all hours, everything, big ones, small ones, hand catching, riding, levitating, tonic immobility, you name it. Well, let's let's go into that. I want to watch that video of you uh, with the Makos real quick. Okay. Let's, uh, that's on one, one of the tabs where he's, uh, that's that's the one right there. So what were you guys doing this day? Who this was filming for? We're, we're looking. We're on the middle of uh, the Pacific I think you Ocean. Full, you could full screen this one, I think. Yeah, in the full in the Pacific Ocean, and all the time they're asking me to talk about. It. I don't want to talk about it till it happens. So I don't know what's going to happen. Is this off the coast of California? Yeah. See, that's that's uh yeah, that's a mako right there. But you see, I hand feed and I put my hand on, underneath them and I lift up on them. Okay, that's a smaller mako. We had six mm-hmm. makos and three blue sharks that day. So you guys are chumming up barracuda and yeah, they have chum in here. But what really does it? See that fish right there? Yeah. I'm gonna take my knife and work it. Right. See what I'm doing right there? That's yeah. what makes it happen. That's what draws the sharks in. Okay. The the knife is a secret. For all that. That's a small mako. So yeah, that was the first one that showed up, and you guys are just you guys are literally surrounded by a chum tornado. I, I grab this one and another one, and then I, I flip a big one on his back. I, this one, I, I, I lift him out of the water and I show him to everybody. It is the fastest shark in the world. The Mako. Yeah, so you don't want to move fast. So you want to let him get comfortable, like right there. You want him to go slow, yeah. Yeah, yeah. See, I, you just, you just got to take it easy mm-hmm. and don't move fast. Let him come around you. You don't want to scare him. Uh, this one bites the the float. They get they get feisty. Uh, mako is very dangerous, but see, this mako is never going to see another human being again. He lives in the middle of the ocean. Right, right. So I like working with them because the people say, "Well, Manny, you're you're working these these sharks around the beach." You know, these the blues and makos are not coming ashore. Mm. I've worked coastal sharks before, but it's been a long time, and I won't I won't work them again. Mm. If I do sharks again, it'll be open ocean. That way. They don't, whatever I do with them, they don't learn, they don't pick up custom, they won't attack people on the beach. They stay out in the ocean. So people are safe. You don't want them getting comfortable see, with humans. See what? Oh yeah, you flipped it on its back. Wow. Yeah, those little You're teeth hand up. feeding this little Mako and he's just shredding this fish right out of your hands. That is wild. So yeah, that's the fear, right? That's the fear when you interact with all these sharks all the time and you're swimming with them and spearfishing with them all the time. They get used to human if, beings. And if they're, not, spear, they're not afraid anymore. If you're spearfishing, you're worse off because you're busy struggling with a fish when the shark comes from behind and gets you. The shark's not attack mm. from behind when you don't see them. Look at that thing. What's that, like a 10-footer? Mm, probably about eight. That's a okay. nice size mako. I always exaggerate on the show. We're not sure in the size, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's probably about three hundred pounds. They're very heavy, a lot heavier than they look. 
They're dense. They're very mm. muscular. Were you ever close to being bit that day, or did they uh, like try to bite you? One of them, a uh, blue shark almost bit the producer. Um, a, a blue shark almost bit me in the stomach. There's a scene in there where I'm pushing off a blue shark off my stomach as I'm feeding a mako, and the blue comes in to bite it both at the same time. Okay, that's oh, a blue. What is, that? is that? What is that, a blue? Blue shark, yeah. We had three blue sharks. What is the story with blue sharks? Uh, they're deadly. As deadly as makos? They're different. Uh, they're both of them very dangerous. But a blue shark, if you offer him your hand, he'll take it. You go, here, are you going to bite this? Mm -hmm. Just come up and he'll grab it. Yeah, they're weird looking. See, I'm, ones, hand, huh? I'm hand feeding them right there. So you did this with Steve-O and those guys too? Uh, we did not this part. What I did with them is I did... I put them on a surfboard one time in the Gulf of Mexico. We mm. put a bunch of fish on them. We had about 25 silky sharks and eight huge tuskies showed up. I had them there. I also had them with a mako and a hammerhead and mako. Mm. I put them with a hammerhead and mako in, in Louisiana also. I did two in Louisiana and also put them before with a lemon shark in shallow water swimming around them. So I've had them about three different times with good, good shark stuff. The mako almost bit his leg off. That was a classic. <sighs> Is that when you got bit by the lemon shark? No, I got bit by the lemon shark when we used to dive on him from the boat. Oh, okay. At what point were you riding those great hammerheads? That was, I sat one day and I, I looked at the footage and I said, I can ride these things. And people said, you're not, no, you're not going to build it. They're not going to let you do that. And I went out planning on doing it and I did it. Uh, where, actually, where were you? In the Keys. In the Keys. So after that, I just rode plenty of hammerheads. He doesn't have a bad temper. I discovered that. Right. I rode a bull shark, and I rode a short distance, and when I let go of that bull shark, bull shark went after me with everything he had. Really? I had to fight him off. Uh, four what did bull you sharks, have to fight him off? Uh, my kicking him, punching him, everything you can imagine. You didn't have a spear gun or anything, a knife or anything? Uh, no. That time, because I was, uh, we, had, uh, we had pole spears for getting bait. Mm. But we were, you know, a lot of times we'd drop everything, and we were in there with our hands, you know. But we were getting bait. We had some stingrays that we had, had killed down there, and they devoured the stingrays in no time. A bunch of bull sharks showed up that devoured it. The water was very dirty, too. And I went down, and I caught a ride on one of them. It was a huge one. And I knew that not to, not to stay on it very long. Mm. Do a very short ride, or he's going to come and get Same thing with the lemon. Right. He'll come back and get you. Can you find footage of him riding the hammerheads? Because that, that footage is wild. Because the, ha the hammerheads are interesting, too. Would you, like, the hammerheads, they never bite humans, do they? They'll never attack a human on the beach. I've never heard of a hammerhead. Uh, yeah, hammerhead will attack. They will. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we wanted to, we were just looking at, we were trying to find the footage of you riding the hammerhead, but um, you rode a mako. So this is footage of you hand riding. Catching. A, hand, hand catching. Oh. It's hand catching a mako. You're hand catching a mako shark. Holy shit. Yeah, take it from the first. It shows you how I grab them at first. So if you rewind like a little bit, maybe a minute. Okay, look at that thing. How big is that mako shark right there? That mako is about, I say five and a half feet, about a hundred and something pounds. Uh, this is a very strong shark. It looks much bigger than five and a half feet. It might be. It might be. It's very. Uh, understand, they're very dense. It could be 180 right. pounds. See how I, I ease, just ease my hands on him? Yeah, mm -hmm. because there he goes. He's like, what the fuck is happening to me? Yeah. So. This is how you hand catch a mako shark. He's not trying to bite you at all. Uh, if you give him the chance, he will. Manny, that is the most insane thing I've ever seen. People that are just listening, Manny is hugging this six-foot mako shark, and the thing is swimming full speed, and Manny is not letting go of it. I'm going to let go when I, uh, when I get back. I told the guy, I'm going to end up back at the boat. If I didn't have camera with me or something I needed to eat, we would have kept them instead of letting I'm going to let him. There's a producer right okay, there. Okay, now his go. mouth's open. Yeah, I'm going to let him go. But I would have uh, I would have tried to keep him. Uh, but, you know, we got the footage. You know that Mako stayed with us the rest of the day. Did he really? After you did that to him? He hung out the rest of the day. All the Mako stayed with us. He's like, hey, left. Manny, come back. I want seconds. <laughs> no, they don't, they don't really care. This is another one that showed up. They kept getting bigger ones and bigger ones. That's a blue. The blues are kind of goofy looking. They're like little torpedoes. Yeah, yeah, they are. 
You know what else is a weird looking shark? Is the thresher shark. They're kind of goofy yeah, looking. I've never they? seen one. They can uh, hit you with a tail. That's what they do. Yeah, they have a massive tail. This is a classic shark, though. This is like for fishermen. When it's hooked, it'll jump 20 feet in the air, land in the boat, bite the fishermen. The mako? Oh, yeah. They'll, they'll jump right into the boat. Yeah, there's uh, there's that girl. What's her name? Ocean Ramsey, I think. She rides great whites. Like she, She'll be like holding on to this great white, riding it in uh, Mexico. And, uh, I think it's in Hawaii. And oh, that's in Hawaii. There's great whites in Hawaii, really. Yeah, they. I think that some of those sharks, if they're well fed and all that, they're not hungry. You can put your whole family on there. <laughs> you know, they're not going to do anything. Her videos on Instagram are absurd. She is swimming and like like kissing these twenty foot tiger sharks on the mouth, like on the nose, and they're, they're like they're all. There's a lot of people doing that right now. I was in Hawaii messing with them. 20 something years ago before they were and she picked up where Jimmy Hall left off and everything those guys but I was out I opened the door for yeah, the click Tigers that, click that top one so you can't do this unless you know for a fact that shark is well fed right like you, you don't you, you don't. can I, they they show the docile side I would fire the sharks up so I did a different right right but still to ride a great white they you can ride one tomorrow if you get the wrong one the wrong time, it might not come out as well. They, so they have like look, they have like different personalities each well, one. Well, this the shark is not being aggressive, it's not being hungry. It's none of that. He's just cruising. Yeah. She it's dives all, down and she grabs this great white by the dorsal fin. At that point, if he wants to kill you, he can. Oh my god. At that point it's Jesus. like Jesus. At that at that point it's like riding a whale shark. How big is that thing, Manny? That's about as big as they get. 15 foot? 16, maybe. More. I think the biggest one ever taken was 19 and a half feet in Cuba. It was long line when they were hunting them for the liver. Sharks were depleted back in 1945 completely. The ocean was wiped out. Then they came back. Then they were depleted again. And now they're back again. So it's always been depending on, on the harvesting. There's been a bunch of... Um tiger sharks attacking people in i think in the hawaii recently there was that you saw the video the tiger shark attacking the guy in the kayak yeah the thing just like well, torpedoes and, and grabs his kayak hawaii in the old days they've always had shark attacks there they have a higher sh tiger shark population than other areas they don't have bull sharks in hawaii to compete with them mm. this is it yeah but that's crazy for a tiger shark to do that to a kayak look at this they, you you just had it full screen. See, when that shark is acting like that, I've had them before where they attack the, the lower unit of the boat, they attack the cameraman. Oh. See, if you jump in with that shark at that moment, it may not be as docile. It may be, a, if, you, if you, that shark sneaks up on you, it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be pretty. Right. See the speed at which she comes? You gotta know uh, people who know, they know who to play with, who not to. Right. There was that. There was a. I told you another story recently. There was these this film crew that was out off one of the one of the um, outer islands off of Oahu, and they were like scouting for a film shoot or whatever. And they had a, one of those inflatable motor. Uh, what is it called? What are the inflatable boats called with the motors on them? Oh yeah. Um uh, Zodiac. Yeah, the Zodiac. They were in a Zodiac and a, a, a tiger shark bit the zodiac like a bunch of times and the thing was deflating so they had to like haul ass back to shore they were like 300 yards or something off the off the beach so they had to like take the zodiac full speed back to the beach they got back just in time the the, the tiger followed them all the way back to the beach uh, these tiger sharks these animals they have behaviors that human beings have never seen before when people think they know everything they don't know anything they're gonna do something you've never seen them do before. They seem hungrier than they've ever been, though. Like they and, seem like they're fucking with us more and more. Well, if there's more sharks, they're gonna wipe out their food supply. Right, right. And you know, it's just like normal. So there's it, more competition. The more sharks there are, the less fish there are to go around. Something like that. In Brazil, there was people. There was a slaughterhouse. They so used to throw all the leftovers from the cows into the ocean, and the bull sharks would come and eat them. They shut down the slaughterhouse, so the sharks moved onto the beach and started attacking people. Mm. so that's that that's another result of that mm. 
we've always fed animals. It's just in the last few years, people say, oh, it's bad to feed you all that. But men have, for hundreds of years have fed wild animals. We've always have. Right. We fed bears, we fed alligators, we fed deer, everything is out there. Mm -hmm. Then in, in my lifetime, I saw an old said, oh, that's a bad idea. It became like a political thing. Illegal to feed animals is bad. They're yeah. getting accustomed to this, accustomed mm -hmm. to that. Back in the days, that's like, yeah, people went to Yellowstone to feed the bears. They went to the Keys to feed the key deer and the Everglades National Park and fed the alligators. Mm. That was normal behavior for humans to do. It's a political thing because everybody is so against killing the sharks. Like, don't fuck with the sharks. I mean, it, before they wanted to kill them all. It's, that's politics. Now they don't want to kill them. When everybody was killing them when I was trying to film them. And I say, guys, I told my friends, you know, we're going to fish. Don't kill them over here because you're trying to get footage. You know, if they're dead, we can't film them, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah, we need more. I need I need sharks, you know, to, mm. you know, it's like, go get them somewhere else, you know? Mm, that right. was my mentality. I'd, not, I'd find a honey hole. Okay, leave this spot alone for me and let me gotta work this area where I can find them. Because we'd go out time after time, we couldn't find them. And I was a expert at drawing in sharks. So mm -hmm. There's a shark 10 miles away. Even chumming come. them up, you couldn't find them. And I'm wow. an expert. I, I was the best shark chummer on the planet. Right. I mean, I'm stupid at many things, but I was good at that. So if the president of the United States came to you, if, if, if uh, President uh, Joe Biden said, Manny Puig, I want you to be in charge of all of the fisheries around the world. And you're, you're in charge of con conservation of all the sea life. What would you make the rules for shark, sharks? I would do the smartest thing to do. You know, I don't want any species going extinct. I would divide them up according to numbers and say, we can take this, we can't take this, so many of this, so many of that. And I would encourage like harpooning so people don't get the wrong type of shark. Spear fishing and harpooning. And Spear fishing, harpooning. So you can so target exactly what you want. Target exactly what you want. A mm -hmm. lot of people, you know, it, I'm not going to go against rod and reel guys and everything, but, you know, some of the sharks they catch when they let them go, they're going to die anyways. Mm -hmm. they've, they've ran into, into death anyways. But, you know, you kill one shark and another one's born to take its place. Mm. None of the species that I know have people made extinct. Mm. We didn't make the hammerhead go extinct. We didn't make the lemon go extinct. The bulls are not extinct. The great whites didn't go extinct. As a matter of fact, they come back. So we haven't hunted a, a species in Florida into extinction. The only thing we ran into extinction in Florida was the black wolf, the gray wolf, and the red wolf. We wiped those out. Now Completely. we got coyotes. Now we got coy in Florida. Now we got coyotes. But we our bear is still here in good numbers, lots of them. Our Florida panther's coming back, which is a Florida mountain lion. That's what it is. It's Those animals are widespread over North America, including Florida. Uh, but everything else, yeah, the, the, the boars were brought by the Spaniards uh, uh, 500 years ago. The boars? Yeah. They're good, the, the hogs. They're good because that's what the panther eats. If you get rid of them, the panther's going to eat the, the farmer's cow. They're going to eat the deer. Mm. The hunter's going to get pissed off at them as they're killing all the deer. Right. So don't wipe out the boars. Mm. You, I don't want the panthers extinct either way. So don't wipe them out. Don't wipe them out. I see everything as renewable resource in a game animal. If you cut a tree, another tree will grow. But you don't abuse anything. But you can harvest so many pounds of fish, so many pounds of this as food. The ocean is not a natural park. You know, God made us so we could catch fish and eat. You know, uh, I have my views. This planet is not overpopulated. We can have dense populations in one place like Miami. Maybe there's a lot of people there, but Overall, the entire planet, we're not overpopulated. You know, that's, was, that's fallacy. We have a lot of wildlife. We have a lot of good land. A lot of this planet produces a lot of food and properly managed. We got room for double what we have and mm. triple what we have as far as human beings. I was, uh, I was reading something recently. There was like a study or a, there was a t statistic that if you took all the human beings on earth shoulder to shoulder, you could fit them all inside the city of Los Angeles. That's how few humans there are. Yeah, you, that's it, like nine billion. <laughs> yeah, you you can. Uh, population has dropped the last uh, mm -hmm. ten years or so. Mm -hmm. We're we're losing people. Yeah, it's a lot to do with uh, like the plastics and shit. So we drink this uh, the water out of cans, not plastic. The, there, but the phthalates and the and plastics of, and like all the chemicals. Of, it's a lot. Of, it's a culture. Mm -hmm. You know, people not having kids. And, yeah, and uh, uh, some people, yeah, they're bent on wars. You know, probably in Russia, Ukraine, is about a quarter of a million dead people on both sides there. Mm -hmm. Easy, you know. So, yeah, that's a lot of people that would have been alive. It wasn't for the war. You know, you get a war, people die. You know that uh, that tiger shark that killed that guy? That was a Russian guy. And there was uh, footage of him when he was, right before he got eaten by that tiger shark, I guess 
he was piling around in a kayak like 10 minutes before that and he was talking shit about ukrainians <laughs> and said, then he gets eaten by a tiger shark yeah you know people in all reality i, I don't know I, I respect human life i'm a christian i do uh animals you can kill them for food i don't believe in abusing animals torturing or anything like that, but yeah hunting for food mm -hmm. growing cows is for food is mm -hmm. fine growing crops uh harvesting lumber It'll slow down the fires, trees grow back. Mm. Re recycling a forest makes everything. Humans are not just damaging. When you clear land, let's like say for cattle in Florida, that brings more grass. When you got more grass, you got more deer, more hogs, and then you got more panther, more bobcat. Right. When you have a very a virgin forest, it has less wildlife. When we go in the ocean, we sink a wreck. That's a fish come and live there. Right. So a lot of what we do. Uh, helps out. We dig a canal. There's a drought. The fish go in the canal. If not, a lot of the fish would have died. So mm. not everything. Uh, the deer, there's more deer around the farm than in the middle of the forest because the farm has got sources of food. Right. So for every deer we had in North America now, uh, we got 30 more than in a time when the European settlers first got here. Right. The pop of deer has grown 30 times over. For every one they had, we got 30 now. Mm. That's how much deer we have because... Woods and farm, woods and farm, woods and farm. Yeah, one of the biggest, con one of the most controversial topics surrounding this de de debate is the ra uh, the Amazon rainforest in like down in Brazil and in the Amazon. It's a bunch of baloney. When I was a little boy, you know, I can go back. The Amazon was was going to be gone in ten years. So it was completely destroyed. They were cutting and burning it like you could see from outer space. I was like, I was, oh wow, they're going to wipe out the Amazon. That's terrible. There ain't going to be no animals left. They're going to do it. this. Is me back then when you were ten. Yeah. Now, look, the Amazon is the same. If anything, is bigger. There's animals like crazy. Look at Pantanales. There's a, every 10 feet is a jaguar mm -hmm. nowadays. Well, they wiped out all the caiman. So the jaguars started attacking the cows and they shot the, the, uh, the jaguars. Now the caiman are back. The jaguars are laying off the cows mostly and eating the caiman mm. in a Pantanal. But the jaguars, have you seen the footage? It's just like this. They get, they're like 20 feet away from the guys. No, I haven't. Boats. Oh, yeah, I can't. I look at my phone every day. So there's um, my buddy Paul Rosalie. He wrote that Mother of God book. He uh, he moved down to the Amazon like when he was like in his late teens, and he started living down there. And he's been like following what's been going on, and it's crazy how many more roads there are now, twenty years later, and how many people are coming in. Like they're the Chinese and the well, are that, coming in and and contracting all the locals there to cut down all the trees and sell them off. Well, they're they're going on Indian land. Which your, that land belonged to you know. If you own a ranch, it's your ranch. If the Indians have a plot of land, you know, it's that's your ranch. You know, private property. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're just stepping on. Uh, well, they bring the Chinese. It's communism kicking in there mm -hmm. again. They're gonna wreck the place. Mm. But yeah, they. But all those roads. Guess what? The jungle will grow over that in ten minutes. You will leave it alone. Right. The wildlife will come back. Right, but they're not. Now, if you it clear, alone. well, they sooner or later something will happen. They'll leave it alone. If you clear yeah, a something forest, will happen like the, our species will get wiped out. <laughs> if you clear uh, a forest, and like in the Amazon, when the grass starts to grow, all the animals of the forest will be there eating that. Hmm. So when you, yeah, oh, in Florida, when you burn a field, you burn it down, you go back three, six months, and all the deer and hogs are there. They're eating the new grass growing. So the forest has to be recycled. So when you do that in certain parts of the Amazon, they get burnt, they get cut down. When it starts to grow back, that's where the animals go. The the pure, pure virgin forest doesn't support that much wildlife. In Russia, really? yeah, it doesn't. They go to where the people are. In Russia, when they started cutting down all the trees to sell them, oh, wow, they're destroying the taiga forest. There's more grass, you know, the stag population exploded. So then the wolf population went up to 200,000 because that was so much stag. Wow. In other words, if there's a lot of fish out there, you're going to get a lot of sharks. If there's a lot of hogs in the woods, you're going to get panthers. You know, it's a, an area with a lot of fish and game, you're going to get alligators. Mm. The animals or the deer, if you have a cornfield in the middle of forest, all the deer are going to be there. Right. And they're going to grow bigger eating that corn. Right. So whatever, well, like the the Native Americans that lived in the East, they didn't have to go in the woods to get a deer. They had, they grew corn. So all they had to do was wait on the edge of the cornfield with a bow and arrow and they could get all the deer they wanted. Right.
because they were going to come there. That's nobody ever thought of that, but that's typical. If it's like that now, it was like that back then. Nothing has changed. Right. That's interesting. People have a lot of fallacy about everything, about the wildlife and and what to do about it and how to manage it and this and that. They go from extreme to extreme. Yeah. They go from exterminate everything to overprotect everything. They don't seem to do things properly the way it should be done over the years. I've taken a lot of interest in that kind of stuff because I've been watching it all my life and I kept track. When I was a kid, there were 8,000 polar bears. So I was into it back then. I looked it up. Now there's between 30 and 50,000. When I was a kid, by the time I was in high school, the leopard population in Africa, sub-Sahara, was about 50,000. They were getting wiped out for the skins. Now there's about 700,000 leopards. The tiger population was down to 2,000. Last year, it went up to 3,000 overnight, one year in India. Uh, the Java tiger, when I was a kid around, completely extinct. So a few areas, they were completely annihilated, but other areas, grizzly bear populations, 120,000 worldwide, including 6,000 in Japan. Most people don't know that. There's 6,000 grizzlies live in Japan. Whoa. Does anybody talk about it? No. There's a, Are people worried about grizzlies being endangered? They were back then. The Mexican grizzly was wiped out. Mm. When, when I was a kid, there were still some there. I, I kept track of that. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of different species like that. Mexican wolf, I think it was completely wiped out. They're trying to bring it back. Jaguars in North America, there's a few in Arizona. They used to be in Texas. They, uh, there's no caiman up there in some of these areas. There was a few alligators, but they're eating cattle, so the ranchers shot them all. So there's none, and except a few in Arizona, they're crossing the border mm. uh, from Mexico. For, uh, mountain lion is found from Canada to Argentina, Patagonia, southern Argentina, through the Amazon deserts, every type of terrain you can find. There, there are mountains, lowlands, everything. Wow. Yeah, it's crazy how much different information you can find when you try to search for this kind of stuff. It's just like it's really hard to find the information. You got to go to just all over the place. You got to go stuff. to old old information from the old days, so they don't change it, mm. and go to the archives of it because somebody will grab the book and rearrange it. Right. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so I I go back to to what I I knew back then. I'm a history fanatic. Most people don't know that. Mm -hmm. But I like to read the history. I like to read my Bible. Um, a firm believer in Jesus Christ, and uh, definitely, uh, we're supposed to manage uh, the fisheries, the forests, food, and all that. Uh, not to destroy it, uh, not to wipe it out, or not to to treat it like a god. Where you can't, you know, some people want to make the entire ocean to a national park. You know, it's like, what are we going to eat? You know, do they really? Well, some people do. Yeah. They want to save everything, and they think the humans are a scourge of the earth, and they need to get rid of the world population and get you know get rid of people because mm -hmm. they're bad. Uh, as a Christian, I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. But uh, people who don't, you know, they, well, I mean, it's know. it's I can see their perspective for sure. I mean, we are kind of like a cancer on the earth. We're just eating up the earth. Then our history. Look at what we've done, like with the way we well, just we, devour everything because we're sinful earth. we're sinful we kill right. each other right. never mind what we do what we do wild animals we're, we're killing each other we have uh people need to respect other people respect mm -hmm. life in general and uh but no uh, wildlife is 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 a renewable resource and certain areas need to be protected other areas need to be open and back and forth yeah but uh there's nothing wrong with raising cattle there's nothing wrong with growing rice there's nothing wrong with uh fishing i used to commercial fish myself and we sold the fish so back then everybody oh meat is bad for you so everybody's eating fish and then they're complaining oh they're eating all the fish mm -hmm. <laughs> but before there was fish everywhere nobody nobody liked fish everybody wanted beef and they started telling beef is bad for you it became a little thing you gotta eat fish it's healthy so they then they say no everybody the commercial guys on the ocean then they ravish wipe out the sea and everybody go, whoa <laughs> you guys said you stop eating beef you start eating fish now they're right. complaining about it you know see the insanity of the whole thing yeah it really is insanity do people really eat barracuda yeah how many people because i've never cuban it's just it's a cuban thing i've eaten a lot of barracuda in my time it's one of my it, favorite you fish said it tastes good it's really good fish 
But what about Ciguatera poisoning? That's the problem. Why now? Why do they have Ciguatera, and what is Ciguatera poisoning? Ciguatera is a toxin passed up the passed up the food chain. It starts a little fish eating it off the coral, and in a barracuda, the older the fish gets, the bigger he is and older, the more of that toxin accumulates. When he has too much of that toxin in his body, it becomes uh, poisonous to human consumption. It doesn't hurt the fish. He looks perfectly fine. But if you eat it, you'll get real sick. And why do barracudas have it? It ain't just barracudas. Grouper, snapper, uh, amberjack, kingfish. They all have it. They, any big predatory fish in the tropics can have it. It's called tropical fish poisoning. Oh. It grows in the tropics. The further north, the less likely you are to get Ciguatera, unless a barracuda swam from the Bahamas to North Carolina. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Which right. it could happen. And then somebody caught a native over there and he got sick as all get out. But if they're up in that area, none of that grows there. So it's less likely they'll get it there. But eat at your own risk. But it seems like people associate Ciguatera with barracudas more than anything. It, it's like, it's politics. It's just like Is reputation. It? Yeah, yeah. It, 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 a lot of people never got it from a barracuda, they got it from a grouper. Hmm. I never got it from a barracuda. I got it from a grouper. Oh, really? Yeah. What is it like when you have it? What were your symptoms? Uh, diarrhea, nonstop. Uh, things that are cold feel hot. Your, it affects your nerves. It's really messed up. And it takes a long time to get over it. How long? It could be years to finally get over it, you know. And if you eat another fish that has a little bit on it, you'll get their symptoms right back. Really? So you got to lay off a fish for a long, long time. I was eating freshwater fish for a very long time. What is uh what does barracuda taste like? It tastes like I uh, compared to snook. Really good, huh? Mm-hmm. Better than kingfish. Oh, way better. <laughs> That's wild. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a great fish. In certain places, like in Central America, I talk to them people see what they're. I never heard of that. They ate all the barracudas they caught. There are places that people eat them and they never they don't know. See what they're doesn't grow everywhere. Hmm. It's only in certain areas that. It, that so if you catch one in like the Carolinas or in Florida, a small one, you should be fine. You should be fine. You should be, but I, you know. I'm not responsible for it. Uh, right, you, you don't condone it, right. I don't, no, you can do it. I just don't, like I tell people, you want to swim with sharks is a great idea, but they're dangerous if they bite you, you know, I'm mm -hmm. giving you a heads up warning. Mm. Well, you told me it was fine. No, no, I'm telling you right now, swimming with alligators or sharks is deadly. Picking up venomous snakes is deadly. All that free diving for spear fishing, you can black out. Mm. You can get attacked by sharks. Sharks are not misunderstood. Put this in your head. It's a very dangerous predatory animal. You know, it makes it the sea unsafe. Simple as that. Mm. Do I like sharks? Yeah, I think they're magnificent, whatever, but they are dangerous. And same thing with alligators. They're magnificent, all that, but they're dangerous. Now, alligators are very well managed in Florida. Uh, they're, they're, they're not protected? Uh, they are protected unless mm. you get your, your license. If you, when season comes around, you get a tag, you get your license, you can hunt it. Mm. So they don't let you just go out and fill up a truck with them. You know, you got to have follow the rules and regulations, which is or orchestrated to protect the alligator as a natural resource and a game animal in Florida. You know, there's big money in gator hunting and gator farming and the whole nine yards. It's a valuable resource, but he's also a very dangerous resource. Uh, the alligators, 400 years ago, when the French naturalist came to Florida, he couldn't cross St. John's River in a canoe without getting attacked by alligators. Wow. They attacked Indians in broad daylight. They're very aggressive, very dangerous. After 400 years of people shooting them, they, they tend to shy away from people. When I was a kid, alligators didn't attack people. They, you could read in a book, they don't attack people. As soon as they were protected and their numbers started coming back and it started getting more abundant, attacks started happening left and right. So alligators do attack people. Look at the history. Mm. They did. He just when they came back, they started doing it again. Mm. So then they started hunting again to slow down the the attacks. But for a while there, they were attacking people left and right. Now they got a nuisance control that if he's in the city, he's in your swimming pool or in your canal in your backyard, whatever, they remove him. Mm -hmm. Before he attacks somebody, kills your dog or your kid or you. You know, just last month, somebody got the, devoured by an alligator, arm ripped off. People. I saw that. There's video of it. Yeah, there, there's all kinds of people getting uh, attacked all the time. The I've, been, I've been attacked a bunch of times by gators. I spent I spend more time in the early days with the alligators than even the sharks. Really? My, I encounter sharks 
I started working hunting sharks at 25. In my 40s, I started interacting with sharks. But I was hand catching alligators since high school, all the way until, until you know, the later years. Now, what is your process if you're, you know, one weekend you feel the urge to go catch an alligator in the wild in some lake in Florida? How, what is the process on, in going about catching a gator by hand? Well, back in the day, I, I would dive on them, have somebody hold the light on them. I'd come running and dive on them and at tackle night? them. At night? Tackle them, hold them any which, any which way I could. Suicide attack, basically. Now, I levitate the alligator. I back away from him, grab him, back away from him. And when he tires a little bit, then I, t- I, I take him down. So you only at night, though? No, I I do it. I can do it in the daytime underwater. Now I can go get an alligator underwater. Okay. Anytime I want. Do I do it nowadays? Not really. Mm-hmm. I haven't done it since uh, TV shows. I've avoided it. I'm an artist. Uh, you know, already lost a finger to to uh, a rattlesnake. I got bit by an alligator on the back. The good Lord told me enough is enough. Mm-hmm. I was swimming down a canal. I got ambushed. So I got bit by a rattlesnake. I got bit by an alligator and caught by a hog all within a couple of years. Towards the end of of my uh, time doing all this kind of stuff. It's sometimes, okay, the Lord does something, keep mm-hmm. you humble, it's slow down. Uh, I got a family now, so right. you know I got more responsibilities, so I, do, I focus more on my artwork. Right. Pull up one of those videos of Manny le- levitating uh, a giant alligator. Was that the canal monster? I think, canal, I think there might be. Canal monster is one of my biggest. I have a tab pulled up for the canal monster, I believe. I got the two biggest gators. One is in North Florida, and this one is in South Florida. Okay. Can you give me some vo- a little bit of volume? And I'm going to see if I can locate him. Yeah, he's already gone under, so I'm going to so try you, to find Okay, so you already th- spotted this, him. This canal is full of hydrilla on the bottom. Yeah, I've seen him from the, from the van. I, I encountered him twice. Canal, carefully watching for any signs of the monster. And then, like a ghost, he begins to materialize. He has left the bank and is facing directly at us. What you're seeing on the is surface. No yeah. He is about to mount a full attack. Oh, I like the voiceover. As he continues to move closer. He is arching his back as a threat. Is he really arching his back? Yeah. <laughs> this thing is literally swimming right towards you. Right. But if he's going to attack you, he's not going to just be chilling on the surface like that, is he? He's going under now. Oh, now he's going under. As he sinks below the surface, I dive all the way to the bottom. Get below him and grab him by the shin. Oh my god. This stops the attack, but now I have a dinosaur on my hands. <laughs> <gasps> You just grabbed him by his like his neck fat, or or his skin, skin, yeah. the skin of his neck. He kicks me in the chest and barrels away. That's like a what, fifteen footer? Thirteen plus. Uh, they haven't seen a fifteen foot alligator, I think, in, in Florida. Oh, really? The record is fourteen foot and a half around there. He glides so he stop near the bank. Not much bigger than that. So, if you move it forward. Uh, so it's gonna be a, he's gonna I'm gonna run him out of there but I'm I'm still killing time but he goes into a hydrilla and I levitate him one more time all the way to the surface oh wow yeah just move it move it a, a little bit so he's hiding in like a little cove right now in like the mangroves yeah no he's gonna I'm gonna he's gonna go I'm gonna I can't get to him so I'm gonna try to get him out of there I can't even I, I can pick up an alligator by the scoot just when he's so big I can't oh my god and he's not even doing anything mm-mm even though you're fucking with him, he's just laying there. Yeah. Uh, alligators that big are great to work with and very deadly. If he bites you, he will crush everything in your body. That thing will kill a horse or a cow. That will kill a whole, drag a whole cow in the water. An alligator that big will. Oh, he's trying to escape. He's trying to run away. Yeah, I'm going to run him out of there. So, see, I, oh I'll my pick him, God, that thing's a Goliath. I'll pick him up once or tw- two or three times and no more because then he'll 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 attack you still trying to escape on the very bottom well no he goes into the hydrilla now i gotta go find him in the hydrilla 
He's like, Manny, please just leave me alone, bro. I'm just trying to take a nap. How long can they hold their breath for? The whole day, of one that big forever. How long? Hours after hours. Hours they can hold their breath? A big one like that. That's a, incredible. Are there any other animals that can hold their breath for that long? Uh, sperm whale. Oh, yeah, whales, obviously, yeah. They go one hour on the bottom, a mile deep, to find squid. Look at this. You just got them right out of the hydrilla. See, when I put the head straight up, it goes into tonic immobility, just like a shark. So when you put his head vertically like that, he's like sort of in a trance? Yeah. It, he, he gets, for a few seconds, he's out of, but see, once I hit the surface, he exploded. Right. But you can see the size of him as you spun around him. Oh, my God. But I've done that so many times over the years. I had so much time with the alligators. Now he's gone. No, uh, he's oh, he's still, on. he's cruising. Yeah, producer's running. Up. He's got the camera on him right now. He's chasing him, looking at him. He's do you talking about it, see? Do you think that... You're more. By the time I told I told quit, they no 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 more. Leave him. Back off. Right, right, right. He's pissed now. Do I think what? I'm saying are 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 humans more vulnerable in the water with a gator or like right next to the shore? Uh, in the water probably. Probably because on shore you can jump back or do something. You still got you you're more clumsy in the water. The alligator is very agile in the water. Mm -hmm. You know, he can catch fish underwater. He's super fast. But they can run extremely fast, can't they? Short, no, just a short burst from here to here. Just you a could, short burst? He's not going to catch you. If you see him coming down the road at you, just run the other way. He's not going to catch you. Really? Mm -hmm. Everyone, I've always heard that, like, if you run in zigzags, like, they can't no, they can't make sharp just turns. Just run straight. Uh, if you're behind a, a tree or something or a post, you get behind him. He's got to get around it, so you can always get around it. And he, he can't get around it, you know. If he's here... He's got to attack this way. He's got to back away so you can get on this side. So you're going to be around the post all day long. Oh, okay. Like he a telephone pole. He can't he, get you. No. If you, if you use your brain, he can't bite you. Right. If you get behind the telephone pole, he goes this way, you go this way, you go this right, way. Right, 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 right. He can't get you. And what happened when you actually got bit by one? Uh, I felt like somebody hit me with a baseball back across, baseball bat across my back. I was swimming down a canal. And I was looking for fish to hand catch. I already levitated a couple of alligators that day. And I got lazy. Didn't look behind me. It's supposed to look behind you in case one is sneaking up on you. And sure enough, one came behind me and bit me in the back. I felt like a bomb went off on my back. He didn't get a good grip on me. If you would have got a hold of my arm, he would have ripped it off. But he, he kind of like slipped away from my wetsuit, pulled away with it. Mm. And he, didn't, he put 12 scratches on my back and a bruise here. He didn't get a good grip on me. And I was able to get away from him, and I came out pretty good from that one. I went after him, chased him off. Oh, you charged him? Yeah, I confronted him. Right after him. he did that? Yeah, I grabbed him by the neck and all that and went with him to the bottom, and then he took off. What? Well, in order to turn around over so he doesn't come after me again. And then I, I was able to get on the airboat, and I said, if I could get an airboat, you know, kick up on it on the side, I might be okay. When I pulled my wetsuit back, they took a picture. Okay, it's not that bad. But I said, I, I got to get in and put bleach on it and everything's Because they can infect you. Yeah, and, but it, when I saw it, it wasn't that bad. It came out very good out of it. They just pour some, some liquor on it and you, you were good? Uh, yeah, it came out very good from that one. Good Lord. Now, what about crocodiles? What's the difference between crocodiles? Have you ever fucked with a crocodile before? Crocodiles are faster, but they don't have the endurance of an alligator. That's what I know about them. Hmm. The alligators, a guy from the Fish and Wildlife told me a long time ago, when they used to c capture them for tagging and all that, the alligators fight twice as hard. Really? That's fascinating. I know in like uh, Costa Rica, the crocs are a big problem. Even when you surf near the river mouse, like they, yeah. they chill out there on it's the It's the same crocs we have here. I've never seen a croc here. Um, they're here. I've seen them. Really? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Not on the beaches, though. I've seen them underwater uh, in Key Largo, the mangroves, mm. uh, Flamingo. It's a good place to see them. Okay. Uh, yeah, they're all over uh, uh, Turkey Point, uh, mm -hmm. Key Biscayne, Coral okay, Gables. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of them in, like around Coral Gables and mm -hmm. all that, Miami and the canals. Right. And 
Biscayne Bay, mm-hmm. you know, Florida Bay, all that okay. area has got all the way in the Keys, right. all the way to Big Pine, all those crocodiles all through there. Right. They just can't handle it. They swam over from Cuba, so it's invasive. Right, right. <laughs> Listen, everything's invasive. Everything is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, they either we brought them or they came on their own. Right. Coyotes came on their own, manatees came on their own, and crocodiles came on their own. Mm. They all came from Cuba. Yeah. And they're in, the, what a coincidence. They're found in South Florida, Cuba, and Jamaica. What does that tell you? In Haiti. Right. American crocs and in Costa Rica. And both sides of the Pacific. So, but it's the same crocodile, the acutest American mm, crocodile. It's, right. it's a very big crocodile, by the way. What is, uh, are there a lot of deadly snakes in Florida, like rattlesnakes and stuff like that? The or big, where, where is the biggest population of, de- of man killer snakes? In Florida? Or in this, the U.S. in general? Uh, probably California's got a lot of rattlesnakes. Really? They got uh, Southern Pacific rattlesnake. I've played with those before. That thing bites you. You're going to be bleeding out of your eyes, nose, and ears, and everything it dissolves your brain. It's horrific. Now, those are in California? Yeah, Southern Pacific rattlesnake. Now, in, in, the, in Florida, we had the biggest rattlesnake, the Eastern Diamondback. It's a dangerous rattlesnake. It's found here. We have the cottonmouth. And we have the coral snake, and we have the pygmy rattlesnake, mm. the smallest, the biggest. And then in North Florida, you get a few copperheads and a timber rattlesnake, which is a canebrake in North Florida. But in South Florida, is only four species. Okay. Two types of rattlesnakes, coral snake, and uh, cottonmouth and water moccasin is the same animal. Mm. Yeah, they're, yeah, those things are swimming around in the lakes and stuff. Yeah. Now, if a cottonmouth bites you, it'll rot you away. A rattlesnake, if you get bit by eastern diamondback, you don't go to hospital, you're going to die. Simple as that. You get bit by any venomous snake. Just go to the hospital. But so what, like, if you don't die, you may lose a hand, an arm, or who knows what. So a cotton mouth. If you get bit by a cotton mouth, there's no saving you. Yeah, go to the hospital. Go to the hospital. You, just, you could potentially be saved. Yeah, yeah, it'll save you. Survive it. You may get permanent damage in your is hand there any, or your leg. Is there any snake that if it bites you, there's there's no chance, even if you do go to the hospital? Mm, if you have everything right there, ready to go. You'll survive, but if you get bit by a cobra in the jungles of India, you don't have uh, anything to save you, you're gonna die. Mm-hmm. A coral snake, it'll kill you unless you get any venom or get in a respirator because it paralyzes your lungs. Coral snake is like same venom as like a cobra. <sighs> what kind of snake did you get bit by when you lost your finger? Uh, Western diamondback, which is like the second biggest rattlesnake. And you were big. where was that? Texas. Texas. What was going through your mind when that when that rattlesnake bit you? Uh, when that rattlesnake bit me, I said I messed up. I'm calm, but it's like it's like depressing. Okay, the trip is over. All the plans you had are over. Uh, you're in big trouble. Right. I, if you look at the video, when it's on, uh, and when it shows me getting bit. Real wild, yeah. It shows me getting bit. I, I, yeah, I look real calm. I'm holding the rattlesnake in my hand. I told the producer, he got me. And he goes, you're kidding. No. I kind of like, I didn't want to tell him, but, you know, <laughs> I got to tell him. It, I was like embarrassed to tell him that it got me, you know. That's it right there. That's the one? And yeah. I was very tight into the snake. Uh, the, the snake filled the entire frame. And as he reaches in to pin its head. He got me to see it. It was so lightning fast. It was so powerful that everything just went crazy. And I could see Manny did get control of it, but my heart was racing and I was really hoping that he hadn't been bit, but I couldn't really tell. He had no clue. I saw Manny's hand reach in and grab this. You can see it. See it. Oh, no, I missed it. Well, you had that the little camera in there. Yeah. Turn the volume up a little bit. Really hoping that he hadn't been bit but I couldn't really tell. So I, I saw Manny's hand reach in and grab the snake by the, by the head. Just, just oh. by the, head. the snake just started moving and twisting and it was such a powerful animal. And I knew that Manny was in trouble. I just didn't want to believe it. You oh my God. For him to come up and say, okay, here's the snake and bring it up. And instead I heard him say, I got hit. And it just, my heart sank to my stomach. 
When we came upon the snake, look at that guy. That's Buck Medley. He's famous. He's got a great beard. I mean, he never misses a click. So as I watched him, his methods and his techniques, I knew he was going to get be able to get it done. So as he went for the grab, the snake was so huge. He got the grab perfect. I mean, the snake's head was this big, and the grab was perfect. But the snake was. It so wasn't strong. perfect. I, sh I needed to be closer. In his hand and actually sunk the fang into one finger and into his hand. See right there? And oh, yeah. That second, <sighs> this is going to be a fight for his life because the snake was just giant and the venom amounts were just huge. I mean, it had to pump everything it had into him. And he calmly looks me in the eye and says, You got me? You're smiling. And a chill ran down my spine. It was like being kicked in the chest. And I knew what Manny was in for. He was in serious trouble. And we are a long way from a hospital. We're 50, 60 miles from the hospital. You got that? Yeah. From that moment on, I knew it was critical that. What is that sound? Go to a hospital or he's going to die. I mean, this wasn't a little snake bite that when you're dove hunting or just out walking around, he gets you, you know, because that's just a quick strike and the amount of venom is just enough to kill like a small rat or a rabbit. This was a huge fang viper that injected everything he had into Manny. Give me the tongs, give me the snake tongs. Okay, we got a new path. Once we realized what had happened, our main concern, the entire crew was get Manny to the hospital as quickly as possible. Every second counts. To the guy, let's get going. Come on, Buck, I need you to pick up all So what was going on right here with your hand? How did it feel? So the pain is the un unbearable pain. Just like, you know, you want to shoot yourself with pain is so bad. So you're immediately after that, you're rinsing your hand with water. They're all getting you to the car and it's just unbearable pain in your hand. Unbearable pain. Then go to the hospital and then the pain lasted for months and months. Just wouldn't go away. So right away, what did you do? Did you hide a tourniquet around your arm or what did you do? No, you're not supposed to do anything. Really? Uh, I put a cold chicken on it, but not even supposed to do that. You're supposed to leave it alone. No He's tourniquet. supposed to leave it alone. Yeah, no tourniquet. No tourniquet will rot you out even more. Really? Yeah. So you just let it roll. You just sit. The let it roll so your body can fight it. Hmm. And how long was the car ride back to the hospital? They did it pretty fast. They were going 110 miles an hour. They did uh, were like 70 miles away, but they got me there in like I don't know, f real quick. Oh my god! It was about 45 minutes or an hour before they started getting the venom and me. Uh, probably about an hour. I was sitting around. Come on. Could you imagine having to get to the emergency room? Like, oh yeah, sure, take a number, wait in line. Yeah, they were like real relaxed at the hospital. Guys, I need about fifty-five gallon drum of anti-venom. Like yeah. now, I'm gonna be dead in like fifteen minutes. We need you yeah, to uh, yeah. hurry up. So they went in there to put anti-venom in you, and mm -hmm. and then uh, then what happened after that? Uh, then I stayed there for several days, four days. Buck took me to his house. I was in his house. I couldn't get on an airplane and go home. I was in so much pain. Mm -hmm. So two weeks later, I went home, and uh, my brother-in-law saw me cleaning my finger, and he saw a finger, and he said, you need to go to the hospital. I took him to the hospital, and then they, the doctor said, you got to take that finger off. It's rotting away. How, how long after was it? Probably about a month. <sighs> it was rotting away. So it was just all black where, you're, where you got yeah, bit? Yeah, yeah. You can take them off if you want. Yeah, it's, my ear's hurting. No, it's okay. Yeah. We can take them off. So you went to the hospital. Yeah. And what was that? What, what did they do? They, the same day you went in, they amputated yeah, it. No, no, no. Oh, when I went to amputate it, yeah, they they uh, they kept come, me overnight. Come a little closer. They kept they kept me overnight, and they amputated the uh, uh, the finger. And they, I told the doctor, "We'll do it as quick as you can, so I can get over this," you know. And I said, uh, "He goes, well, I can take the whole bone out, and make it look better. No, I don't care. How is the hand more efficient? I don't care what it looks like." He goes, "If the finger does survive." It's going to be like a hook. You're going to get in a traffic accident when you're driving. Mm. So to make your hand more useful, you got to take it off. So that was it. And how long did the pain last after they amputated it? Yeah. When I levitated a large alligator, I was already missing the finger. Wow. But was like the sharp pain there for a, for a while after they did the amputation? Month after month after month. I forgot how long it was. It was just a never-ending pain. The hand was swollen forever. It was swollen every morning and try to stretch it. The pain was unbearable. It was just like... I couldn't pick up a cup of coffee and they would fall out of my hand. I didn't have a hand was so weak. Good Lord. No more of that. No You're retired. That. No You're officially retired from catching snakes and alligators and sharks. And uh, you're just focusing on your art now. 
uh, focusing my art, um, sticking with that. That's a gift that God gave me. It was an art. I was an artist since I was a little boy. Mm -hmm. I was always in school. I had terrible grades except for art class. I was always the number one student in the art class. Mm -hmm. So I was into art, wild animals. That's what I like. I wasn't into sports, you know, uh, basketball, baseball, or any of that. I mean, I, it's great. I like it. Uh, athletes are great and all that. And I'm, I'm happy for them, but it was never my thing. Hmm. I'm not into it. The wild, the sea, and the the forest was always my thing. Now, do you ever just Rivers. like? Do you ever just like want to go out and just catch a fish on a rod and reel, like traditionally, or is there is that just too yes, boring for you? I sometimes like I go out with my friends. Sometimes gigging tilapia at night from the airboat, throwing a trident at them. And that's like, okay, we go out and have a great time with the guys, catch a bunch of tilapia, take them home, fillet them, and eat fresh fish. That's mm -hmm. more like my idea of hunting nowadays. Right. Uh, I don't want to get big fish anymore. I want to get medium-sized fish, just stuff to take home to eat. Mm. My idea before was the action for the video, but I've done so much of it mm -hmm. that why am I going to do any more? I'm right. not going to top what I've already done. Right. Pretty much. So right. I've done it. I, everybody's out there messing with the sharks and everything right now, but I was doing that 20 something years ago. Mm -hmm. So I was ahead of the game and all yeah. that. Now, I mean, and God bless them all, and they're all into it now, but it's, uh, yeah, it's a dangerous thing. And But everybody wants, but the, there's so many people doing it. It's kind of like you want to do what nobody else is doing. At the time I was doing it, nobody was really into that kind of, to the point that I was doing it. What made you want to specifically design these tridents? Like, what is the tactical advantage of having a trident? These three pronged. For people that don't know what it is, why don't you grab that trident you just made me for me and show and I'll pull it up so people can see it? This is this is a trident. This is one of my specialties, of work that I do. I make this out of three sixteen stainless. Uh, these were done to catch fish to hunt. The first trident I designed, big one, was to hunt wild boar. Because when you throw it, instead of one point, you got three points coming out. And that's it. like that giant one on the wall back there right, that you made right, me. That's yeah. for catching a wild boar. Wild boar, alligators. Uh, yeah, that one's probably got alligators before. <laughs> <laughs> that one's heavy as shit. I can barely hold that thing. Yeah, well, that, you use up weight and momentum for a hunter. Right. I caught alligators by hand, but when we took out, you know, I guided, take out alligator hunters. Mm -hmm. These guys, okay, they want to get an alligator, a trophy gator, whatever. They can use a gun or they can use a, a trident on private land. And a lot of them would use the trident. They would mount the gator, pack the meat, take the, the skin or, or meat home with them. And then uh, a lot of times they bought the trident. Yeah, so, now, when you hit a gator with a trident like that or like this, do you have to like aim for a specific part of their head? No. If you hit them in the head, it'll bounce off. Oh, you can't hit them in the head? No, in the body. So it'll hold them. And then you got to cut the vertebrae here with a knife or, or an axe. So to when it. you when you hit him in the body with the trident, you like in the back or something. Yeah, it's got a rope on it, and you hold it. It's him. got he a rope, and they take off. No, they don't take off with a trident. They take off with a harpoon tip, and then you got to follow them for a while. When you hit them with a trident, they stay in the same place, and they just spin around and twist. It uh, they don't maneuver well. It does it quicker. Oh, okay. The trident actually, the harpoon does, they use doesn't actually kill them. The trident does. So after you hit them with the trident, they twist around and they tire out and then you have to jump on them and you have to... Well, pull them out and have the guy, uh, you know, this is a, a guy is hunting. He wants to go on a primitive hunt. He could have used his rifle. He can use a bone arrow. He can use a trident. We left the option for him to do, if we want to do a primitive hunt with a trident. And, you know, a lot of times they do. But I like medieval stuff. Uh, I like history. I like ancient weapons. I mean, tridents were used for fishing. That was originally what they were for. Mm -hmm. But uh, the Roman gladiators decided to use them on each other. Mm -hmm. So you see that in the arena, the gladiators are fighting each other with these things, which is, you know, it's a horrible thing to do, but mm -hmm. to attack another human being, you know, right. uh, having each other so for entertainment and going at it, you know. Right. Uh, I guess some people still like that kind of stuff. They haven't changed. I, I, there was a gladiator event, and they were fighting each other. I don't want to see it. No. I'm at that point in my life, no, I don't, I'm not interested in seeing two people go at it with this. Right. Uh, you know, that's ancient Rome mentality, no. So once I hit the gator with this, say hypothetically if I'm going to go try this, and I hit the gator with it and he's twisting around, how do I go in there and like actually like you pull end him, him, end his life? You pull him and use, usually I have a, an extra trident, an extra harpoon, stick it in the other one in. It's a process. And then pull him out and then another, it's just like three tools and then a hatchet to hit him in the back of the head, okay. which I also make. But I have a harpoon. That you, once he's there, you stick the harpoon to double secure him. This will usually hold him. Okay. But in case he gets, if you hit him in the back, if you hit him on the side, the skin 
closes in around this. So it doesn't come out. You hit it in the back, it can come out the same hole because the skin in the back doesn't contract. Mm. It's like stays the same. So it can pull out sometimes ah, okay. out of the middle of the back. But the tridents that hit the, the side here, once you get off the scoots, the skin will wrap around this and it'll hold it. It won't come out. Oh, wow. Sometimes you have to surgically move it out of there. So that's the reason this is barbed. It's, to, it's really to catch a fish. So when you're catching an alligator, you're catching, you know, a large fish. You know, it would probably, if you're in the shallows, you could probably throw it at a shark. Or a example, barracuda. Yeah. Well, that might be too wide for a barracuda, huh? I mean, no, that uh, would work for a fat barracuda. Yeah, it depends. You know, anything will work on anything. That other one will... That little one over there? That'll work on a barracuda mm. very well. But like, if I hit something like that with a shark or whatever, I'm afraid it would take off and I would have to dive in after it and go get well, the fucking... Put, no, I, I, I want to no, lose no, my no, trident. No, no, you put a... See this hole back here? That's for a rope. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You put a, a strong rope And you there. just tie that to something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's... uh, Yeah, you tie that to... It depends where you're going to get... Yeah, I mean, if you're in the flats, you can get a shark with this. No problem. Mm -hmm. If you hit him from the boat... Yeah, it'll, and you put a buoy on it. Yeah, he's not going to, you're going to get him, you know. Right. But if he gets off, you got a line and everything on it. Mm -hmm. So you pull, you try to back up, you know. This is pretty strong, you know. I mean, yeah, to break this is hard. Yeah, it's know? industrial strength. Yeah, industrial. This is three, this one here is three quarters thick, solid stainless. It's got a tail that goes to here. This is crunched, smashed in here. All this, I do, I dig this out by hand with a handheld, handheld grinder. That's why I do all that. And pe you make these to order for people? Like when they hit you up and you, they, 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 yeah, they want to try it? Uh, yeah, uh, I can get them the fish and try them, which is more like the one you got over there or this one. Those are the two that I'm making. So they pick, they tell me what they want mm -hmm. and we'll take care of it. How long can you hold your breath? I used to do five and a half minutes, 5.35 to be exact. Now I haven't done it a long time, so I seriously doubt I'm, I'm going to hold my breath that long. How long do you go right now? <laughs> Not much long at all. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't trained for it, you know. I How got, do you, you train to hold your breath longer? You train a little bit, but a lot of it's technique. It's preparing. When you're out of shape, you got to prepare better. When you're in good shape, you can get there quicker. You know, it's your deep, slow breathing, but that's what also gets you to pass out on the water and die but like how would you like before you go out in like a, a spear fishing competition like free diving competition in a tournament or something like that how would you actually prepare to do that to hold your breath longer well you exercise you train you go do underwater laps you do sitting still you know people spot on you you hold your breath as long as you can without moving uh you do your breathing exercises and everything and then i had a method i do when i was going to be underwater a long time 40 breaths 40, 40 breaths deep, first? Deep, slow breaths. Now, what can happen? Uh, you can black out on the water and die. And so it, the, it's a deadly game. How do you black out? You don't, you're underwater, swimming around, you're relaxed, you're fine. All of a sudden, you don't know what happened. Next thing you know, you're being, you're, people rescued you. And you what are you doing? And you don't remember what happened. You, you're total blackout. Does that reality. does the blackout happen only when they get to the point where you're like really close to being out of breath? No, the brain doesn't tell you how much oxygen you have. It only lets you know how much carbon dioxide you have. So if you've been exhaling and breathing fast. You could be out of oxygen. You don't know. So when you run out, the brain doesn't let you know. You think you got plenty of air and you don't have any. You don't have any more oxygen left. You fooled your brain. And does that happen from just holding your breath too much and doing too much free diving? From the, mainly from the deep breathing. From the deep breathing. From the breathing, fast breathing, hyperventilating before you go down. Uh, you deep breathe and you hyperventilate to get rid of the carbon. It, see, to be able to relax on the water, you got to have get rid of your carbon dioxide. Because that's what makes you... When you want to breathe, it's not that you're out of oxygen as you have too much carbon dioxide in your blood. So the trick is you fool the brain. Then you can stay down as long as you want till you die. Have you ever blacked out free diving? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, in a swimming pool. In a uh, swimming pool? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the girl I was training for free diving uh, pulled me up. And I asked her, I asked her, what are you doing? You're, you're disturbing my, my routine. And she goes, no, you blacked out. You're completely out. So I would watch her. She watched me over training in a swimming pool. <sighs> As our team at the time, uh, I was working with Mark and Megan. She was Mark's girlfriend. <clears throat> uh, she was freediving champion, Megan, freediving uh, free champion 
Oh, really? Uh, yeah, for the U.S. at that time. She held the record for male and female at the time. After you blacked out, what did you do? Did you did you just like take a break for a while, or did you go right no, back in? Did you go right back in and start diving again? No, next day I was diving again. The only thing I was more cautious because I've come, right. Make sure you have somebody watching you're you and close, spotting you. If you're close to blackout and you don't black out, you'll get like a dizziness, and that's a samba. When you black out, you won't get that. You go all the way. You'll never get that warning. But There's I've had just that. No warning at all. You just black yeah, out. But if you came close and you survived, you're whoa. You could feel there was a dizziness. Mm. So wow. that that's that's like I did that too many times, diving by myself, going down a hundred and something feet to shoot fish, free diving, waiting on the bottom to shoot a fish. I would go 110 feet of water and lay on the bottom for like 40 seconds. At yeah. 110 feet. Yeah, just lay on the bottom down there. I would start counting at the time myself when I was on the bottom. And then I swim back up, so all by myself. So there's no with weights watching. on you, weight belt. Uh, if I had a, a speedo on, I would use four pounds because I was very lean back then. Mm -hmm. If I had a wetsuit on, depending on the thickness, I would put more weight depending on the thickness of the wetsuit. I could swim four hundred feet underwater. Swim four hundred, so you could go. Two hundred feet. You could dive down two hundred feet and and uh, two hundred feet back. No, but swimming both ways. That's when you go down, you don't kick. It's only halfway. You fall. You only kick on the way up. Right, because you're fighting against the weight, the weight belt. Once you, you put a little bit of weight, once you break 30 feet, you should be able to free fall. And then you just line yourself and the deeper you go, as your lungs compress, you speed up down and you keep clearing. Is there st After a while, I can't get air into my ears and I got to stop. I blew an eardrum doing that. Uh, how deep How deep were you when you blew an eardrum? Man, I, mean, I could have been 180 feet or 200 feet. There was a marker at 220. I could see it. I was trying to get to it. And uh, the watch only marked to... To 165. After that, I quit marking. Oh my God. That was a gauge. So I kept going after that, and it boom, sound like a firecracker going off in my head. You lose your equilibrium and shit when that happens, right? You do, right? but I, I got up so quick before I lost my equilibrium. I aimed and shot for the surface a million miles an Can't hour. Can you hurt yourself flying. doing that? Yeah, well, I mean, when you go home, you blow your nose, air comes out of your ear. And I blew another one with a power head, too, so I've blown both of my, I've blown both of my eardrums. Blew one with a power head? Yeah. It just blew up next to you? I fired and it went off in the water and the concussion, wow. Oh my gosh. Popped the eardrum. That's insane, man. Well, Manny, thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. This is, uh, I, I thank you for the trident and uh, bringing the t-shirts and all the photos yeah, and everything. It's, maybe we'll it's do amazing. something in the future, man. You know, get some other clients here. I would, love, I would love to get you here again, man. I, okay, I, uh, but I'm a huge fan of, of what you do and your artwork, especially where people that are like watching and listening, where can they find some of your stuff or how can they contact you if they want to get a trident or show your knives too? hold your knife up. Uh, Manny Puig on Instagram. And just contact you, message Yeah, you there's message. a picture of me holding a shark jaw. I got my face in it. Yep. A bull shark jaw. Just Manny Puig, just contact me and let me know. Well, interest, I got t-shirts. Hell yeah. I got uh, knives. I got necklaces. I got all kinds of goodies. Here. Look at that. Tiger shark teeth. Great what white. Of, that's a great, great white, white tooth right there. Great white. And also have uh, fish hooks. Oh, that's cool. Too. Hawaiian style fish hooks. That's incredible, man. And I make crosses too. I got. Oh, yeah. My cross. And you carve custom custom shit into them, like people's yeah. names or yeah, any yeah. kind of custom messaging they want? Yeah, they, they can custom their name on there. That's beautiful. Uh, this one here has got 316. Mm -hmm. It's 316 stainless, right? 316 is also the yeah. most famous verse in yep. the Bible. Yep, You know, John 316. That's Look cool. Look it up. Definitely. Awesome, Manny. Well, thanks again. I very much appreciate it. I'll link your Instagram below for people to contact you. And uh, we'll get you back here to tell some more stories. Definitely. Cool. Goodbye, world. Great time. Take care.